Professional Excellence December 3rd, 2020 Governing Board Meeting. I'd like to um, start with a roll call vote of our board members. Uh, board Member Monroe. Here. Board Member Gregson. Here. Board Member Lyon. Here. And Board Member Sobrante. Here. And I am here. So we have a quorum. And Board Member uh, Sobrante, would you mind as the Vice Chair leading us in the flag salute? Happy to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Well, thank you. And welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all, uh, those that I can see, see you, and good morning to everyone. And I hope you wish, I uh, hope you had a great Thanksgiving, and we have a great board agenda this, uh, this morning, and uh, lots of uh, updates that I think will be very helpful for our board members as well as the general public. A couple of announcements before we head into our agenda. Letters from the public on matters before the board are aggregated and filed in an electronic folder and sent to the board by staff. We appreciate the public's cooperation in emailing all meeting related correspondence and public comments to the CCC, CCEE, uh, CCEE at uh, CCE-CA.org by 7 a.m. today, immediately preceding the board meeting. Public comments that were received will be read aloud prior to the board action or following discussion of the agenda item to which the comment corresponds or under the agenda item eight for general public comment, if any. The public can also provide public comment live during today's proceedings by either calling the call-in number displayed or by submitting a public comment form via the short URL displayed on the current slide. Public comment guidelines can be found on today's board agenda, which can be accessed again at the CCE website, ccee-ca.org slash meetings. Uh, quick reminders to our speakers. Uh, if you are speaking during public comment, please introduce yourselves and identify who you are prior to speaking. And a reminder to our board members to unmute their microphones when speaking and mute them when they are not speaking. It's also important that the board members speak clearly into the microphone so that their comments can be properly recorded as part of the proceedings. To accommodate our presenters uh, today as we dive into our agenda under item five, I'd like to move item five up in the agenda uh, following directly after item three, where we will pause for a 10 minute break uh, before proceeding to item five. So I'd like to ask the board if there are any objections to uh, moving item five up in the agenda immediately after item three. Okay, hearing none, Leanne will go ahead and make the adjustment to move item five up to item th uh, for immediately following item three. That takes us to item one, approval of the minutes, uh, minutes of the August 6th, 2020 regular board meeting. You have the attachment. This is a discussion and requires action. Do I have any discussion of the board minutes? Okay. There be none. Are there any public comments? Leanne, no. I take it that there's none? No public comments at this time. Thank you. Okay. Then I'll um, ask for a motion from the board to approve the August 6th, 2020 board meeting. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion by, I think that was Monroe. It, yes. Correct. And a second by board member Lyon. And we'll do a roll call just to make sure, go through this. Uh, board member Sobrante. Aye. Aye. <laughs> board member Gregson. Aye. Yep. Board member uh, Monroe. Aye. And board member Lyon. Aye. And board member Navas, aye. Uh, minutes pass and motion passes. It always seems a little odd to have you motion and then ask you again, but I see no objection from Jim that I'm doing that. <laughs> so Jim, is that the, that's a proper proceeding? If it's not, I'm sure you'll let me know. Yes, that's fine. All right. So far, so, so good. All right. Well, takes us to item two. 
the executive director's report. This is a information discussion item. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, it was a year ago today, I think, Matt, that it was your first meeting. We were at CSBA and we planned these meetings in December so that we could all be at CSBA and we're not at CSBA. Um, but some of you, I think some of the board members may be participating still as I know the conference is still going on too. So uh, we look forward to being there next year. I know, uh, but I wanted to thank Matt in particular for, I know it's been a year now and for your leadership, especially during this time where we've made this switch and, and uh, you've really just done, done a really nice job and been very supportive of me and our team during this time. So I want to take that opportunity to thank you and always take an opportunity to thank Leanne and Michelle and all the other, all of my folks who make these things happen and they're doing just a wonderful job. Um, I think we're getting a little better at this each time too. So and Josh, I know is on the call and we're trying to do our um, public speaking, our public uh, requests here folks who call in today a little bit differently so that we can be more responsive and um, to hear from them straight up as we haven't had in the past. So we'll see how that goes today as well. Um, we've got a couple of items on the report. We do have a really busy agenda, so I won't be too long winded. Um, and I'm going to have Carla speak a little bit at some of what's going on with our direct technical assistance. In particular, we have a couple of districts, um, both Sac City and Oakland, where we'll be completing our service in the next month or two. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of work that's been involved in that. And so we want to make sure that the board is aware. Uh, we also are, have been updating the superintendent of public construction, Tony Thurman, quarterly. We've been sending those to you as well, too. So Carla will kind of share a little bit about what's going on with some of our districts, which we refer to as our two plus districts that were identified in the dashboard two years ago now, I guess, right, a year and a half ago. Um, so um, we'll make sure that we're able to do that. I wanna make sure that you're aware of what's happening in those districts because there's a lot of work that's still going on even during this distance learning and uh, this time that we've been going through in the fall. And then Ronnie is gonna share what's going on with the system of support. We had a meeting recently and so we'll so share some updates with that as well as some things that are coming up. Before we did that, I also wanted to take an opportunity to, to let you know that we're with Brooks Allen now in his new position. Uh, Brooks has reached out and has really been um, asking our support, um, doing some things a little bit differently than maybe what we would normally do. And we hosted um, on behalf of the administration here a couple weeks ago and now, I guess, um, Dr. Galley and Dr. Pond um, had over, over a thousand, about 1,300 people, I think, or so who participated in that. We found out about that with like two days to spare. And, and uh, as always, uh, our team jumped in and Michelle in particular, and Suji and, and Dorcas really jumped in and kind of made it happen. And then even we even asked Michelle to facilitate it. And um, what I share with folks too is about 30 minutes in, we were done with the script and we still had another 30 minutes. So she did a great job of monitoring the chat and making sure that we could really, um, the question and answers really address some of the questions specifically. It looks like uh, as of last night, we're gonna do another one of those probably either next week or the week after before the holidays. Um, I know that the, both the doctors want to be, they want to continue to do this, in particular around the education side. Um, so in particular for our board members, um, I would encourage if you've got specific things that you would like to make sure that they address, right, or ideas around some of the things that you're trying to sort with out there directly as you're working with districts or in a district, um, let us know. So we'll make sure that we can get those questions posed because we, we do get to give a little bit of insight there. Um, we're also doing some other work too with a, uh, I have a meeting this afternoon with Mike Fine to, as you know, there's, um, with all the testing that's going on with COVID testing, there's real concerns, I think, out there on the cost, the health cost and what that could be due to local JPAs and the increased cost. And so um, Mike and I are working on helping to facilitate a meeting with some of the uh, the state organizations, you know, that have in regards to those JPAs as well as some local JPAs to have some conversation around what they're predicting around that so we can answer questions and that would be available to folks in the field to to listen and, and kind of facilitate some questions around what their predictions are around some of those costs. And then there's a myriad of other things that are being discussed um, that uh, I'll, I'll update you in the, in the next couple of weeks as things start to unfold. But we're just trying to be a resource in particular and trying to be supportive in any ways that we can help. Um, so the team continues to shift and as well as we continue to focus on the other areas that, that you'll hear more about today too. So I wanna thank our team 
in particular for their willingness to continually pivot and uh, navigate through this piece too. And uh, they're doing a great job. And so, and with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn to uh, Carla. And Carla, I think there's a PowerPoint that she has to share a little bit around our DTA work. Thank you so much, Tom. Good morning, board members. It's wonderful to see you all and, and thank you for this opportunity to be able to give you a brief update on where we are with some of the direct technical assistance we've been providing. Uh, in particular, if we could go to the next slide, I'd also like to just remind us and ground us together on when does CC provide that type of technical assistance support. And as you know, uh, we have two major pathways in which districts might be connected to for, uh, connected with CC to provide that type of advice and assistance. And so the first is this continuum of support where a district uh, may have been receiving already differentiated support, and yet over three years, they have still or more have not uh, demonstrated progress for three student groups or more consistently across those three groups. Those three years, you have not seen progress. So it's one of those areas where we are then asked to, as part of that continued support, continue to work with the county office as well as the district to then determine where are some areas that maybe we could provide some additional advice and assistance. And so as, as you know, we typically go through a process where we try to assess. There's been some great work that's been going on many a times in these districts. And so we want to understand what has worked well. And then we want to understand where are some areas of improvement and be as specific as possible around instruction and teaching and learning. So we really make sure we get grounded through our systemic instructional review process in these areas. The next thing we do is we engage in some progress monitoring. Uh, and in a second, I'll share with you some examples of where that's been working really nicely and where we've started to be able to engage in some of that progress monitoring, even through the pandemic. It's been an interesting thing to see how the districts really see this as an opportunity, this collaboration to strengthen some of the work that they know they need to be prepared for now, as well as in the future as students return to school. Uh, and then we provide ongoing support. So immediately as we begin to assess where some needs may be, we may identify through our process that we need to start providing support now. But then once the systemic instructional review is completed and to ensure that those recommendations and action steps are met, we then will be able to go back and provide that ongoing support. And so it's something that is, is something that may start in one period, but goes on in making sure that those recommendations are implemented and that we are able to support the district in creating that pupil achievement change, uh, in particular around those student groups. And again, in a second, I'll go over what some of these district student groups may be. As a reminder, these are the four districts uh, that we're currently working with now in this, uh, based on this criteria. Next slide, please. The second major pathway is through the emergency apportionment. So these are districts that have received the state loan, uh, previously AB 1840, now 52074 guidance, but really it's one in which there's a re automatic referral for CC advice and assistance. And, and again, we use a process where we're looking to assess what has been working well, because many of these districts, we've had multiple partners from CDE to FICMAT to the county and so on. And so we really try to make sure that we understand what has been working and what has not to be able to provide that advice and assistance. Uh, through our SIRP process, we will identify recommendations and work again in partnership with the other statewide agencies to be able to determine how can we be able to ensure that the district is on track to make progress. Uh, the two districts that we are working with in that capacity has been Vallejo and Inglewood. We are in progress monitoring with both of those districts. In a second, I'll go into a little more detail. But again, we're engaged in ongoing support, um, which, uh, which is great is that we also get to leverage a lot of the resources that the county may already have or CDE may already have throughout that ongoing support. And then we also may coordinate and facilitate ongoing meetings as needed. Uh, some places uh, we had did them much more frequently because the need was there. We were trying to make sure that we were all coordinated and organized in what would be considered support for the district. Uh, in other situations, it's just making sure that we're updating folks on a regular basis of what's happening in the district. Um, and so in a second, I'll, I'll provide more of an update with that. Um, I also will be joined by our new director, Matthew Roberts. Dr. Roberts uh, recently joined CC a couple months ago and will be providing an update with some of the districts that he's working with as well uh, with me. Next slide, please. 
So as you see, the two districts that we've been engaged with for emergency apportionment, I'll start off with Inglewood and then Matt will take over and start to share on some of the other districts we've been working with in, uh, from a continuum support as well as emergency apportionment. Uh, so Inglewood Unified School District, uh, we have been engaged in progress monitoring with them from the SUR. Uh, they're at a place where quite amount of the work is in progress based on our recommendations. They've also been very heavily focused on FICMAT recommendations and how those things integrate. So we have made sure that our SUR process is something that is in alignment with the FICMAT process. So that way they really see how these pieces are linked together. And that way we can also contribute to them being able to move out of receivership. The, the way in which we've been also supporting is providing two positions that are focused on data and special education, which have been the main areas of concern within the district. And we have been able to continue to see progress in those areas uh, at, per the SUR. But we also recognize that there's instructional efforts that needed to be grounded during the during this time and prior, we have had uh, professional experts working directly with the team to be able to work on things like their distance learning plan to some of the cohort work that the district has engaged in. And Dr. Torres, the county administrator has done a really nice job of engaging folks and being able to share their progress as they've been able to make progress across FICMAT and SIR recommendations. So uh, I, I have shared some of those as well. I'm happy to share more if folks would like to see more of those kinds of progress uh, monitoring tools that they've created. Um, Matt? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Chair Navo and members of the board, uh, Executive Director Armelina. Thanks for your time this morning. Um, for Vallejo City Unified School District, uh, the SIR was completed in 2019. And we're currently progress monitoring and ensuring that the recommendations of the SIR uh, report are being um, executed. And so we're right in the middle of that. And to do that, part of the support that, that Dr. Estrada talked about earlier uh, to support the SIR process, we have one full-time staff member uh, that we're currently onboarding. This is a key position because this is one that interfaces with the county office very well uh, in, uh, in that area. And so we're, we're very happy to, to have that, uh, that person on board. Um, in addition to the other initiatives that, um, that are going on within Vallejo in terms of MTSS, uh, within their special education units, uh, et cetera, uh, we're, we're there to support them. So our primary focus, and especially of this key person in place, is to focus uh, to ensure the SIR process and the recommendations are carried through. So. The next one that I'll talk about is Sacramento City Unified School District. Um, and the criteria that Sac City Unified um, uh, qualified for, for services were there are students with disabilities, uh, subgroup or a student group, uh, foster care youth, and students experiencing homelessness. The SIR is uh, in the, its draft mode right now, the final report, and we're busy diligently working with the County Office of Education and district leadership to sort of finalize that report. We expect the SIR to be completed around uh, December, uh, later on this month, not around, but in December uh, 2020, hopefully before the holiday is our target date. Uh, we have uh, meetings uh, set up with um, the state of public uh, uh, superintendent of instruction. Uh, and so to begin sort of messaging that. We have one part-time professional expert uh, working on MTSS and uh, special education now uh, in the district and just trying to support as the as the recommendations uh, emerge. And the report will be public um, in January and will, will actually come out um, in January. And so I um, expect that to, to be right around the corner. So we're excited with the amount of work that the team has done over the past few months, especially given the COVID uh, constraints that we've been under. So um, our progress is moving forward on that one. The last one that I'll present on before turning it back over to Dr. Estrada is Mount Diablo. Uh, and Mount Diablo is, uh, we had begun the SIR process um, uh, prior to uh, the COVID breakout, uh, and once COVID hit, you know, we uh, we uh, were had to sideline it for just a, a short period of time. We've kept kept Mount Diablo engaged, especially as a new superintendent uh, sort of emerges. Uh, he's coming from Vallejo, as a matter of fact, um, and as that new superintendent, uh, Superintendent Clark, uh, comes on board. Um, we uh, are continuing to sort of work with them to um, set forth a new timeline uh, for to resume the SIR process. And that will begin in January, like the first week of January, once we get back, we're arranging uh, focus groups as we speak now 
We expect that, uh, so that SIR process and that inquiry to be completed in April of 2021 with reports uh, forthcoming from there. Again, the, the student groups that were identified uh, in Mount Diablo were uh, students experiencing homelessness, foster youth, and then of course our African-American uh, student group as well. Um, so we're, uh, we're excited to sort of uh, turn our attentions now uh, even more to Mount Diablo and, uh, and sort of push that through. So a couple of really key ones in the works and uh, certainly Vallejo we're, we're moving forward to. Thank you, Dr. Estrada. Thank you, Bort, for your time. Thank you. So Oakland Unified School District is also a district that during uh, this, this, uh, the pandemic, we have been able to continue to work with them and in collaboration with Alameda County. We've been meeting regularly to understand where are some of their areas of need and continuing in the SIR process. In particular, we've been focused on English learners, African-American students and students experiencing homelessness. Uh, this has been really a great partnership as well with the county and district to understand community need. Uh, stakeholder engagement. We've had quite a few interviews as well as review of documents and data, but those stakeholder engagements have been really critical and informative. And so we will continue in that process. We just had our mid-SWAT review with the district this week where we start to share some of the high level themes that are surfacing. And next week we'll be meeting with Alameda County to begin to share those and start to draft our first report that we will then get feedback on. Um, that report is the aim is to be able to have that completed by the end of January 2021. Um, we are already in the process of working in partnership with the county to identify a, a staff member that will be working uh, to focus on instruction and accountability as, a re, as, a re, as it relates to the SIR recommendations. Um, but it's also to make sure that the work is integrated and that we really are building capacity within the district. And so uh, grateful for that partnership, that position will be posting soon. And so what's nice is as they're engaged with us in the SIR process, they're learning and engaging with us as we also start to learn what are those recommendations and can, can continue to work with the district once we've been able to develop those recommendations. Uh, the next district is Salinas Union High School District. We just completed their SIR in July. We've been engaged with them in the county office in being able to identify which of the recommendations should be a priority. Uh, the goal just for all of our districts is just like Inglewood, where we have some clear guardrails of these are the recommendations, what's your progress, all of our districts will eventually be there. Salinas is in that process right now, and we'll be able to uh, provide updates to the board, as well as the state superintendent and his team, uh, to be able to make sure that you know what is going on in, in, in these districts, what's their progress, where have they made progress, where the areas are continuing to grow. Um, I think what's really exciting with Selena is that they've been thinking about our recommendations is also living in the now, as you all have been, I'm sure, uh, finding for yourself is that these recommendations have some good, strong um, strategic strategy focus, but there is some real issues right now that they're trying to deal with. And so what's been nice with the county and our partnership is we've been able to use our resources to support addressing what's in the SIR as well as what is they're dealing with right now. So for example, Selena's small cohorts, figuring out what that should be as well as intervention. So we continue to work with them in that process. So this is a brief update. Um, in the future, my aim is to be able to come back to you all um, and be able to share with you more concrete progress um, as well as some of the focus areas um, and be able to share with you more deeply what those have been. Just a, a few comments just to add to you. You heard us reference, you know, these full-time positions. Um, I wanted to be clear too that we're, the way we have done those is that actually the county offices are actually the employer. So we, we really work with the county office to have them take ownership of that position. They work within their salary schedules and their position. And so um, we work through them and then we place those positions directly in the district on behalf of, to really make sure that the, they're there to be a support to the district, specifically on how to make sure that we're addressing the areas within the SIR so that they can be a support and help to them too. And as you know, we've had various positions in Inglewood and we'll monitor those positions, but these new positions are specifically focused on, on integrating those activities around the SIR. Um, and so we really appreciate the county offices and really taking on that role and they've all been really willing to do that. Um, we really feel like that's a really good strategy you know, to really make sure that we can support the district as we help them in that work too. So 
lots happening there. There's a lot of work. I really would encourage the board um, to, uh, we'll make sure we get you copies of these uh, as these surveys are being completed to really read those. There's a lot of work there that really goes into it. And I, and I think one of the things that we're all conscious of is there's a lot to do that can't be done quickly. Right. And so particularly what we try to do is, you know, we address these, you know, these 12 areas. So there's a lot of information there that we're trying to do. So we really then try to really work with the district to say, OK, what should you do first? Right. And how do you do it within the context that you're living in now? Right. In the environment that you're there um, so that it's really focused. It's aligned with really um, those high priority areas. Um, and so then. And then we also try to do this progress monitoring where we're using our short cycle that we learned from our pilots, right, to really help them. What are we going to do this, you know, within this next 30, 60, 90 days in particular? How are we going to measure that? And so as you saw, Carla was able to share Inglewood in particular, right, because that's the first one that we did. We have strong, we have internal indicators that we use to really determine are they making progress? Are they implementing those strategies? Are we seeing those things getting completed? So you'll start to see more of that as we start to kind of get to, you know, further on with these other districts so that we can, we can point to specific data, right? That's really determining, you know, how are we doing towards the progress on the areas that were identified within the CERB. The other piece too is, is we're also trying to really increase transparency around that and really make sure that, you know, everybody's kind of aware of, of what's happening there too. So you'll see much more of that, um, both on our website as well as other places similar to what, what FICMAT does too, to where that information is, is available for the public as well to be able to see the progress and the, work, the hard work that people are really doing. So I wanna thank Carla and Matt and, and that team too. They work really, really hard and, and it's, it's very difficult work, very sensitive work as well. So I have Ronnie available also. Ronnie's gonna speak a little bit too. Before we move on maybe to Ronnie, does anybody have any questions in particular, Matt? I didn't know if uh, the board might have questions specific to the DTA or if you want to wait until the end of this item. No, I'll, I'll let, if the board has questions, there's a lot there. So if they have questions, I think this is a perfect time to ask any clarifying questions. If not, we can wait till the end for a better discussion. Any clarifying questions, board? Nope, seeing none. Tom, we can go ahead and move on then. All right, Ronnie. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. I am going to be uh, presenting some information now about the system of support and will also be coming back to talk with you a little bit later about the system of support evaluation. So during um, uh, the executive director update, I just wanted to provide you with some information about the all leads meeting, which happened on October 29th. So just as a quick reminder, um, many of you know that the system of support is coordinated in collaboration uh, with CDE, CCEE, and state board staff. And so all of those staff members participated in the planning and implementation of the um, all leads meeting on October 29th. This meeting was a chance for us to um, meet new members of the system of support. I'll go through them those in just a second. And then also hear from some of our system of support partners who are coming to the end of their funding cycle and had final products to share with the system of support. So as you know, the system of support is a network of lead agencies that have been selected and funded in order to provide support in specialized areas, uh, including equity, um, English learner support, uh, and many others. So we can talk about that a little bit later if anybody has questions about those specific areas. But we have a few new uh, lead agencies that have entered the system of support. So one of the first ones that our participants heard from, and we had over 100 participants on this webinar, as you could imagine, it's difficult to coordinate a webinar with over 100 people, but we had um, a great system of breakout rooms where our participants could sign, could sign into any presentation that they wanted to. And then we also recorded all of the presentations so that they were available for anybody who wasn't able to sign in at that time. Maybe they had a conflict, they had another meeting. 
but also for any of our stakeholders who wanted to view those. So all of those recorded sessions are available for you to view on our CCE website. And they were linked in, um, Tom, in uh, Executive Director Armelino's report. So you're welcome to take a look at those at any time. So one of the first groups that we heard from was the um, 21st Century California School Leadership Academy, 21 CSLA, which is being led by UC Berkeley and they are coordinating most of the activities around the 21 CSLA and um, supporting the regional academies. So in this uh, session, we heard from um, the executive director who is coordinating activities with UC Berkeley and several of their partners around what's coming up for 21 CSLA and the structure of 21 CSLA. We also heard from the grantees involved in the English Learner Roadmap Education Educator Workforce Investment Grant, who include uh, the multilingual uh, California um, co uh, Collaborative Organization and EL Rise, who are the grantees who are coordinating activities um, for that grant and all of the upcoming events. They, they just completed um, their um, implementation of funding. And so they're just getting started and they were really previewing their activities for participants on the call. We also heard from the California Coalition for Inclusive Literacy, which is uh, supporting the Special Education Workforce Investment Grant. And um, again, they're just getting off the ground and doing quite a bit of work to understand what the needs of the field are and get their activities up and running. So those were the new lead agencies that we heard from. And then we also heard from um, the lead agencies, Santa Clara County Office of Education and San Diego County Office of Education, who for the last two years have been doing um, equity work under the California Equity Performance and Improvement Program. And so these two organizations um, have reached the end of their funding cycle, but they had final products to share with the field. Um, and with each of our lead agencies. And so we heard from San Diego County Office of Education about the equity professional learning um, that they've been offering online. And uh, they were able to view those and experience some of those professional learning activities. And then additionally from the Santa Clara County Office of Education, they have recently published their Ways to Equity Playbook. And uh, the authors of that playbook went through and helped uh, the participants understand how to implement and use that playbook. So when we looked at the data from the surveys of participants that participated in the webinar, the, the feedback was actually really astounding. We had um, you know, 96%, 98% of participants reporting that they agreed or strongly agreed with the fact that they learned something that helped them improve their ability to support local LEA or their local education agencies. And then also the, the sessions increased uh, their ability and interest in collaborating with um, any of those new or existing projects. And so because we were able to utilize small breakout rooms and, and individuals were able to choose their sessions, we feel like they were able to really target their time to find out more information about the, the lead agencies and activities that were of most use to them. And so this is a format we're gonna to continue to utilize where we have some breakout sessions, where we have each of the lead agencies, whether they're a new or a veteran lead agency presenting about the activities and the work that they're doing across. We'll continue to record these sessions and make them available publicly so that anybody can access them and learn how to uh, contact them, coordinate with them, collaborate with them. Um, and we're really excited about um, some of the work that's coming. As some of you might know, we have a few new lead agencies that are continuing to come into the system. We have a new literacy grant that will be launching soon. I, they've been selected and so we're getting them um, ready to integrate into the system of support. We have the dyslexia grant that's going to be integrated, supports for um, students with dyslexia that will be integrated into the system of support. And then we have um, many of our agencies, um, especially our SELPA leads who have best practices that they have um, uh, ready to share, especially as our LEAs have been transitioning into distance learning, hybrid learning, face-to-face -face learning, and then back again as our counties um, transition into an orange status. So we're continuing to do our best to provide these supports to our county office and um, other lead agency partners. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. And like I said, you can view all of these present, all of the presentations that happened on October 29th on the CCE website at your leisure. Thank you, Ronnie.
it, this has been incredibly informative, uh, Tom, and there's a lot in there. I, I know the board members probably have clarifying as well as uh, deeper questions. I have a few. I'll, I'll open it up at this point if there's no other comments, Tom, for the board discussion. I, I just, I have one comment. Um, I was able to pop in and out a little bit on October 29th. It, it was very impressive. And, and I think Ronnie said something that's really important and almost viewing some of those system of support um, engagements as a showcase. I mean, not that we would necessarily use that phrase, but I know that um, later in the agenda, we're gonna have the evaluation piece. So I'll save some comments for that. But one of the things that we saw in that evaluation was people still wanted to know how to access the system. And I think any opportunity that we can have to showcase all the various elements. I love the fact that the recordings are you know, online and you know, finding ways to, to push that out, I think is important, but almost taking that showcase mentality. I mean, at, at times there'll be the need for dialogue and engagement with each other. Um, but I think those types of showcase opportunities are really important so people know uh, what's out there. Great, thanks member Samrante. It was great to see you in some of those sessions and we appreciate your time. Any other comments, questions from the board regarding item two? I have a question. Thanks sure, Ronnie sure. for your presentation. I really appreciate it. I was not able to join on the 29th and hope to be able to join in the future um, as it's not only important work in the state, but certainly important work for county offices to, um, you know, to be aware of. And uh, certainly I had my team members present. Um, what I am wondering is we, uh, I don't know what phase of the system of support we would, you know, re refer uh, to this as, but um, as we progress with so the system of support, are you, what are you seeing in terms of um, district um, uptake and engagement? Um, I, you know, it's, it's something we've talked about before and it's something that, um, at least for me, I've wondered is, you know, is that the audience at this level? Um, right. And so I'm just, I'm just curious to, to know what you're hearing either through that particular experience or uh, subsequent experiences. Yeah, it, it is very complex because each of the lead agencies is defined in statute slightly differently and, and their audience is defined in statute often. So the GeoLeads, as you know, as one of the county offices that who has a geographic lead, their task really is to support their partner county offices, right? So I, we think that that work is progressing very well. Those relationships, you'll hear a little bit later in the evaluation that we have a framework that we're looking at and using around what, what uh, supports effective change um, by using this network structure. And so what we're, we're finding in that evaluation is that those relationships that are geographic lead um, agencies have developed with their county offices are really increasing the uptake within the system of support because then they can share the information of the other lead agencies that might actually have more of a direct role in supporting LEAs. So for example, our community engagement initiative, as you, I think you heard at our last board meeting um, from Stephen, our community engagement initiative is um, directly engaged with LEAs and that work is actually uh, moving along very well. And so I think that that's one example of where there has been direct work with LEAs that's been very successful. Many of our SELPA leads are also not only engaged with SELPAs across the state and county offices across the state, but they, ha they have all been implementing a series of workshops, especially since the, um, the pandemic has struck that have really um, shared best practices um, in their areas of focus directly with LEAs. They, some of them have cohorts going where they're implementing those best practices. They've archived and shared out all of those resources across the system of support. So I would say that it just varies and it depends on what the, the focus of each of the lead agencies are. And then obviously as the system of support has come into being, um, some of the, 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 the lead agencies, like each of the um, equity leads that we talked about with San Diego and Santa Clara, they targeted a specific um, set of LEAs within their grant application that was approved initially. But once they worked with those specific sets of LEAs, now they have shared their resources statewide and they're working to 
get everybody up to speed on using those resources, even though initially they might've only worked with a small um, team of LEAs. Yeah, I would, I, would, I would add to that too, that and I, it's a really good question too. And I think it's, it's really important for folks to see kind of the shift too. If you look at the system of support and you look at the early leads, the geo leads, the SELPA leads, as Ronnie shared too, they, you know, we're really built, obviously, you know, we look at our system as level one, level two, level three, right? A level, level two, we all know is around differentiated assistance. A lot of those early resources were built around that, mm -hmm. right? And since that time, in particular now with the literacy leads, the CSLA, the Educator Workforce Investment Grant, the resources that have come the last couple of years, I think are much more focused around level one. Mm -hmm. right much more around trying to make sure that there's resources for the field more specific to districts right not necessarily waiting for you know dashboard results that say that they might need support right but being able to recognize that they, and there are key areas they're, they're chosen for a reason because the dashboard data has pointed to where we see that you know those needs are within the larger context of the state um, and so a lot of those are now just starting to get you know, they've just been chosen, right? We're just starting to see. So we should really start to see an uptick around some of that delivery, which was kind of a key to this last meeting because you, those folks are now reporting out, we've, we've been chosen, here's what our theory of action is, here's what we look to do um, within this next, you know, especially even starting in the spring for many of those resources. That's great, thank you. Thank you, board member Monroe, that was a great question. Any, any other comments? From the board, questions? Tom, I, I have a few, but I wanna be mindful of our time. So maybe just, I'll just tee up one to the team. Uh, um, could you de just describe for, for us again, what does the process look like from when those districts that are in the 2.5 potentially move into 3.0? What does that process look like? And, and maybe add how, how are we anticipating or working with CDE around the, the potential issues we would have from spring testing that could result in more districts being referred to 2.0 supports and our ability to support that. So yeah. uh, and I, those are two questions that are quite lengthy, but br briefly, Tom. Um, yeah, I'll try to be brief. I think we can be part of the first part of the question. Remember on the, we call them 2.5 because there really is no, in order to be 3.0, right? Which basically says that the a district was identified in the dashboard based on their data where they had these student groups that consistently, you know, over th three year period, the same student groups, two or more student groups within that district I guess three or more student groups of the same student groups had not, you know, continued to be in red. So we know that we have four were identified. So that's the first step. So they're identified. Then it, it, the statute speaks to the CCE has to go in and make some determination that it, does the district have the capacity to be able to address the needs of those students. And if we, if we, uh, um, whatever we determine that we make recommendations then to the state superintendent to decide if the state superintendent would like to be able to use some of the authority that they have under that statute of 52072, which talks about being able to put an academic advisor in the district, being able to make changes to their LCAP, and they're, those are their specific things. So when this first happened, we reached out and we worked with the department to try to determine, and we had shared that we had developed this, the SIR, right? We had done that already prior to, um, in particular around Inglewood and, and um, is a way of being able to go in and try to identify what exists, what is happening in the district, because uh, it's really hard to determine what their capacity to do is if you don't really, really know what they're doing. And so we, what we suggested was we'll do the SIR and what we'd really like to do then is, is be able to do the SIR, but we don't want to just go in and make this determination. We'd actually like to go in and determine where it is, as you know, we use the SWOT analysis look at their strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats, and then work also with the county office who's already been working with that district to see what progress that they've been able to make. And then together, continue to try to help them before we would suggest that they would then be, you know, determined that they didn't have capacity, right? So 
that I think is a little bit of a nuance there. And so what we've determined, so what's that timeline I think people often ask, right? So how long will you be there, right? And part of that will really be determined on the progress that they're making. So as I mentioned earlier, this progress monitoring, we see is a real key piece. So as we know, we can't, you're not gonna go in and make that kind of change that quickly in these districts who struggled for quite a while with these student groups. And so, Part of our goal is to, one, once we've identified where it is that they might need support, help provide the support, work with the county office specifically, progress monitor. So that's why you're seeing these quarterly reports that are going to the state superintendent for those four districts in particular. And then along the way, right, um, if we see that we're getting to a point where we're just not making the progress, I mean, we would really like to make that determination both with the county office, right, who's still doing work around DA, as well as some of the work that we're working, as well as its superintendent may have particular questions or opinions around the data that they're seeing. Then we would have to then make that determination, you know, that they then now would have to be, uh, they would go under the authority of the state superintendent in regards to 52072. So that is that. Um, that's the system, Matt, that we kind of created and developed. In regards to the spring, I, I don't, I can't really speak to that at this point because I don't know. Um, you know, we don't know if we'll have a dashboard in the fall and if it's going to be consistent with what we've done in the past. But in statute right now, if we, the data is still the same, right? It's in five two zero seven two says if we have districts that qualify, right? This is the current process. So do, if we do have a dashboard and we have new districts that qualify based on the criteria that currently exist, then we would use the same process that we're using with these four districts. That's great. Thank you, Tom. That was, that was, that was very helpful. Any last comments from the board questions before we move to public comment? I just have one and it's not really a, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, just a wondering, um, because as I look at these different areas and I really appreciate both of the, the presentations, um, the pandemic is only going to exacerbate all of the challenges that these districts already had. And, um, and the areas that we're, we have focused on here with our system of support leads um, really need to have a thread that runs through them that's going to be about what that um, transition looks like, that reopening, because I think we're all really worried about these gaps that have already existed widening. And um, so I'm just wondering if I, I heard a little allusion to that with both Tom and Carla about the idea that, you know, where are you here and now, how does that impact going forward? But it just concerns me that um, as we talk about how much time this takes to improve a system, um, we're really taking three steps back and I don't see a step forward right now. And so I just, you know, love to hear, if, I don't know if that's at, at this time or later, how we're going to address that sort of acceleration piece that I know CCE staff are working on. Um, especially with our students with disabilities. And so I know that's a focus for a number of our districts and I'm just concerned about what we're gonna do to amp that up. Yeah, I think one comment, and it is probably a larger conversation, but um, you know, Ronnie talked about these new leads in particular. One of the, um, maybe nudge is the right word, right? Is many of those um, applications, if you were, were actually, were actually before the pandemic. So for example, CSLA is a great example, right? That was all designed around something that we felt needed to happen, right? And so we're really trying to ask them to think about, okay, so this is what you were going to do. This is where we're at now. So have you thought about what you should do now in response to where the needs of districts are, right? And so you mentioned, for example, you know, I, I refer to as mitigating learning loss, right, as an example, right? And so how can we be more responsive to what the field needs now? Because what they need now look, might look different than what they needed prior. So how can we nudge them and shift them to be thinking about um, being more responsive to the current needs, not necessarily what the needs were prior? Great. Board Member Lyon, anything else? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Let's, let's move to public comment at this time. Um, Leanne, do you have, is there any public comment on item two? I, I saw Stephanie raise her hand if she had another comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just had a real quick comment just to piggyback up of what Sandra was asking also what Tom was saying. With the literacy leads and the dyslexia leads, I'm just wondering if there's been, Ronnie, if there's been any conversations amongst the entire system of support about how to integrate uh, those new leads and also how to utilize them in this area of remote learning because literacy 
as we've seen with many of the na national data and some of our state data that our students are their student their growth is being really impacted in ELA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been planning for how do we integrate them into the system. As, as you know, sometimes once they get their funding, it takes them a little time to staff up, get, get their work centered, maybe even get a website up and, and figure out a way to communicate with the system. So we're really in that phase of the work right now um, as they get up and running, um, having received their grant funds. Uh, so we are working on how do we maybe host another webinar similar to this one to get them integrated into the system to get them so that they're developing relationships across the system we know that that's a key element of this work that that those partnerships really come out of those relationships and then also how do we as the state agencies help to disseminate and um, help them scale some of their work. So what support can we provide? And then what connections can we provide? The, the Special Education um, Educator Workforce Investment Grant, it's also focused on literacy, in this case, inclusive literacy. So how can we facilitate conversations between the multiple literacy grants that are happening so that they are building on and relying on each other for that work. And so those conversations are taking place, bless you, taking place at the um, state level uh, within the system of support coordination team. And as you know, we have a new um, member of the system of support coordination team, Anissa Sonnenberg will now um, serve as the a, a key staff member from CDE on that coordination team. And so I think that those are the conversations that we have scheduled in the coming weeks between State Board, CDE, and CCEE. Yeah, Great. Matt, Thank just you. one last comment too that I'll, and I know we're trying to move on to, but I, I'm thinking about, it's kind of where this conversation started with Tim's comments about what we saw last week too. We still have work to do. When I say we, it means all of us, right? And everybody within the systems board and everybody out there that has an opportunity to, actually there's a lot of resources that are available that people don't know are available, right? or they don't know, and, or we have, I think the, the struggle I think I've seen during this pandemic in particular is, is that, or there seems like there's this massive amount of resources and people don't know where to start, right? You can spend, I've done it myself. I'll spend hours sometimes on the internet searching and going through all these things. And four hours later, I found one or two nuggets of something that was actually really helpful that most people don't have time to do. So I think, Tim, your point, and we're trying to do it through our newsletter. We're trying to highlight, you'll see it today, you know, in our next, our spotlight on Combat California. We're trying to be really specific. We're trying to be uh, thoughtful about our playbooks on three or four particular nuggets, right? But I think um, we've got to continue to do a better job of that. Right? We've got to continue to think about it can't just be our job, right? It's kind of got to be everybody's job to try to figure out how do we make sure that people at least have know what's out there already, because there are quite a bit of good resources that really exist that I just think most people don't know are out there. Very, very true, very true. Okay, board members, any last comments? And I apologize, Stephanie, I can't, I couldn't see you in my, so I got the screen all set up now. Any other comments? Okay, there being none, Leanne, are there any public comments on this item? No public comments have been received. And let me check with Josh. And no call in comments as well. And no call in. Okay, there being none, I'm going to go ahead and close this item to try to see if we can catch us back up because I know we have presenters that are we're counting on certain time frames, and I'm, I've already blown up the schedule. It's already off. So <laughs> let's move to item three a spotlight on Comeback California Schools. A campaign featuring San Juan Unified School District and San Juan Teachers Association. This is an information discussion item also. Yes, and so I know we have Michelle Magog that's going to introduce this item. Michelle, this is, she's been doing some incredible work around this too. So Michelle, if you'll introduce our presenters. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Navo and members of the board. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, we'll go ahead and just jump into it. I'll try to make up some time. So um, just a quick reminder, the Comeback California School uh, spotlights LEAs uh, across the state on their collaborative approaches um, and insights and innovations. Uh, we've been primarily focusing on their efforts uh, around the safe return uh, to 
return to school for staff and students. Um, we also focus on kind of the continuity of learning and we link to our resources related to that, uh, how we can support educators in equity and really address some of the complexity of the transitions uh, we're seeing LEAs are having to make. We launched the campaign back in July. We focused initially on Marin County Office of Education and their partnership with their uh, county public health. And today we have the pleasure of really digging in a little bit deeper on our spotlight that features San Juan Unified and their partnership with the San Juan Teachers Association. Next slide, please. Go ahead and advance to the next slide again. So I am pleased and honored to introduce our presenters, our guest presenters today. Uh, this is the leadership team that we had the opportunity to interview as part of the Comeback California uh, campaign. And uh, we only had about an hour with them, but if you have the opportunity to uh, review the website, you'll see uh, a host of quotes and comments and resources uh, that were really helpful and insightful. In particular, we talked about the collaborative partnership between the district and the teachers association and their ability to reach an agreement around distance learning uh, as they were transitioning to that during the summer they were ready to return in person they had uh, an emergency meeting in july like most LEAs, and they were able to figure out how to move forward and launch distance learning. Uh, so we have the pleasure of hearing from Superintendent Kent Kern. Uh, as you can see from his bio, he is the 10th superintendent of the district, and he has spent his entire career in the district, which is pretty amazing. And if you want to hear uh, a little bit more about that, if you go onto our website, and you look in the San Juan section, we have uh, the section on collaboration. And at the top, uh, we feature that emergency meeting that the, the board had in July. And he starts the meeting uh, giving the history of his background. And it's actually um, pretty motivating and compelling to hear um, kind of his perspective on his view of the district over many years. Uh, and instills a sense of confidence uh, in moving forward during a period of time where there was incredible uncertainty for the board, uh, the staff, the students, the families. Um, we're also joined by his team, uh, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Schools, Student and Support, uh, Melissa Bassanelli. And she's had many leadership roles in the district, but most recently she's been pivotal in supporting their understanding of synchronous and asynchronous learning, uh, convening a large number of teachers to develop resources that were aligned to their essential standards. And so we featured that content um, and background as well on, on the website. And finally, they're joined with uh, Shannon Brown, the executive director of San Juan Teachers Association. She's also invested many years into the district as a teacher, but some of you may know her as the 2011 California Teacher of the Year, uh, which is pretty impressive. And uh, she was a member of Superintendent Torlickson's Accountability Task Force and was really pivotal in infusing the teacher voice and informing the new accountability and continuous improvement system. And so we are just thrilled to have them join us today. And I believe they are online and I hope that they are able to turn their cameras on and they are here. So I will turn it over uh, to the San Juan team. Thank you. Michelle, thank you so much. And, and Tom and members of the board, thank you for allowing us to have some time to share with you today, uh, especially during these challenging times. Our focus today is, is going to be talking around staying in partnership during the pandemic. And we're going to kind of cover three areas. First, how we built the foundation of trust. And Shannon and I will talk about that. Uh, Melissa is going to focus on the process for creating the distance learning agreement. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about our current reality, which is conflict, because it's important to talk about even during challenging times, everything doesn't always go exactly the way you want it. So we wanted to highlight how we're working through that. So we'll, the, all three of us will kind of focus on that last area. Uh, and so Shannon and I will kind of just play off each other in this first piece. We wanted to start to talk about just the relationship that we have and how we have built this over time. Um, we've kind of moved past this idea that we collaborate with the union and to the idea that we are true partners. When you think about the partners that you have, whether it's the partner you live with, um, other partners that you interact with frequently, there is a level of communication, there is a level of commitment, um, there is a level of trust that you have to build to get to the point to have a strong relationship. And that's really what we've strived for over the years. Shannon and I have the opportunity along with the president of the Teachers Association during normal times 
to meet together twice a month. We have breakfast once, we have lunch, but our communications go way beyond that in terms of um, touching base on just about everything that's going on. Shannon just called me a week and a half ago on a Saturday. She got a call from somebody, texted me, do you have time for a talk? And we connected multiple times over the weekend because in order for us to really have the partnership that I believe we need to move the work in San Juan Unified, we have to have that commitment to each other. And that has happened over time, um, but it takes work and it, it takes a lot of energy, but the, the benefits that we get out of it are just tremendous. So I kind of wanted to just lay that as kind of the, the groundwork um, for really what we believe in as a team, because I consider all three of us that are presenting today uh, the, a team that has to work together for the good of our students, especially during challenging times like this in a pandemic. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Shannon at this point. Thanks, Kent. That was a great uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. So um, I want to just talk a little bit about a couple of things that lead us to having the trusting relationship that Kent has described. And I really can't express this one enough. Um, we do not argue about who cares more about kids. Um, on the surface of it, um, it seems like an exercise in you know, theory, et cetera. What is underneath that, that is so particularly damaging is that it means that you are questioning the other side's motives. So um, that is a critical piece that we have agreed to that we do not use uh, who cares more about students as a weapon um, because it does undermine trust. So we agree we all care about kids and that we have different perspectives. Um, so uh, the other thing that we agree to un under that is that we have shared goals. We all want a high quality education system for our students that helps them become uh, as successful as they possibly can be. And we need to be creating systems that allow the adults to make the work sus uh, sustainable. So both of those pieces contribute to us creating high quality education system. Another big one is, and Kent and I talk about this often, uh, we have to understand each other's political realities. So the union's job is to create the conditions for our members to be the best professionals they can be and the conditions for the work to be sustainable. And Kent understands that. So when we have differences of opinions, uh, he, again, we don't question each other motives. We say, hey, here's what I have going on. Kent talks about either community voice or what the board is saying or what he's he hearing from students in his advisory groups. And we're just honest about the pressure points that we have. And we don't diminish each other's concerns, which is another one. Um, and again, to, to build on the analogy that Kent brought forward, when you're in partnership with somebody, you cannot dismiss the things that they value and tell them, but they should care about what you value. So we always have to come back and talk about, okay, this is a pressure point for you. Here's our pressure point. And in reality, because we have such authentic conversations, it is why we come up with such innovative approaches where we can create, if not complete win-wins, um, at least we have agreements that demonstrate that both sides' interests have been considered. The last point, and then I'll turn it back to Kent, is uh, we also have an agreement of no surprises. So Kent has not one time asked us as an association to not be in the role of advocate, but, he all, but our agreement is if we're going to uh, reach out to our folks, if we're going to come to a board meeting, if we're going to email him a formal letter, we just let him know in advance, hey, here's what we're going to do. We don't try to stop each other from doing what we need to do in our um, uh, respective roles but we do try to make sure that the other side knows here's what we're doing and why. Thanks, Shannon. I think one of the things that we all need to realize is that no individual's job in education has changed and become more challenging than the teacher during this because it has completely changed. And so during this process, we really have valued the voice and feedback from the association. And that has helped us troubleshoot. I think a lot of the problems that we might have faced 
Um, and even publicly saying that it's been interesting. I think I've said that once or twice at board meetings. And I've had a number of teachers email me afterwards just saying, thank you for acknowledging us in that because it is true. Their job has completely flipped. I mean, as a superintendent, my job is always hard and it has gotten harder, but it has not completely changed the way that teachers have. And Shannon, you wanna hit that last point there? Sure. I think this is another um, important piece. And again, it's about what it means. It's not always about the action. So the district does not try to undercut our communication with our own members. In fact, when there needs to be communication out, we often are the ones that communicate to our own members. Uh, we run surveys, we send out our side letters of agreement when we reach them. Um, and if the district is going to communicate with our members, they let us know what it is. And sometimes we determine who is the better messenger to get that uh, communication out. And the reason that's critical to uh, continuing to build trust is that the district acknowledges the union as the representative of our members and does not try to go around us. So um, it is an important part of being in partnership. Melissa? So in talking about the creation of the distance learning agreements, we do believe that in order to do best by our students, we have to do our best for our teachers. And so that really starts by co-creating and partnership together we are, I think, pretty unique in that we don't exchange formal proposals. So neither side is drafting um, lengthy formal proposals and then presenting it to the other team. We engage in ongoing dialogue so that we can understand each other's interests and realities. Um, it's not essentially starting with a blank slate, but it is starting with a blank document and really working together and co-creating um, what our system needs and how to best meet the needs of our teachers, create those working conditions in order to get the work done. Um, so in terms of thinking about the pandemic, we have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours um, in dialogue, in a Google Doc, working together on the various side letter agreements um, that have been developed um, over this period of time. And in doing this and, and going through the process of sharing this work together and engaging in the dialogue, engaging in inquiry and really truly co-creating together, it shares power. So by natural districts have power, management has power in terms of you know, fiscal oversight and um, decision-making and um, historically teachers feel like things are being done to them in creating space for the co-creation of our side letter agreements and the way that we partner together, it helps share power, um, which has been, um, it builds trust, but it also helps us as district leaders and managers um, keep things real in terms of, um, there's a lot of theory and ideas that are generated. There's some really good thinking that happens. Um, but sometimes it falls short in practice because we um, because we don't have the voice of those doing the work. And so by engaging in this way with our teachers association, we're really able to stay connected with the voice of those doing the work um, so that we can then integrate that into our best thinking to formulate those plans for implementation and then also um, use the Teachers Association to help gather feedback so that we can continue to refine and um, further the development of what we're doing. And again, doing best for our teachers so that we can do our best for our students. Thanks, Melissa. So we're in an interesting situation. So we shared all of that, but our current reality right now is that we recently working through all of this co-creating the models that we wanted to implement when we would come back to in-person learning um the the union putting out their surveys to their members us surveying our community as well as to what they wanted we came to a point where the majority of the teachers in our elementary division wanted a model that when we looked at it when we were co-creating these models we didn't know all the unintended consequences well one of the things 
uh, that would happen in one model is we would have had to sh significantly shift a lot of students from the teachers that they currently had. Now that was the model that the teachers overwhelmingly in elementary school liked. So we came together, Shannon, it had to be probably about three weeks ago, three, three and a half weeks ago. And we had probably six hours set aside and about halfway through, we just said, you know what? I, I in my role and knowing where the board is, cannot implement a model where we're gonna have 10,000 kids shift teachers um, in the middle of the year. So I am going to impose a model, uh, a model that your union and the majority of your members did not want. So normally in a situation like that, the superintendent says, I'm gonna impose, the union would demand a bargain and we would go like this. Well, instead we stayed together for the next three hours and said, how are we going to work through this? What are the demands that you have related to bargaining that we need to work through? Um, and I think people often talk about um, collaborating and it's easy in good times. And what do you do in good times? And I think it's really important for us to share with you today. And I, I, I appreciated Tom being sensitive to our reality and, and he sent me a really thoughtful email. And I said, no, I think more than ever, we need to have the opportunity to share with you because as, as a partner, you don't just at the first sign of things not agree, having agreement, go your separate ways. So how do we continue to work together through this? Um, and that's kind of where we are in working through now, what is our differences and, and what are those demands to bargain that the union has? Um, and still, how can we, as we impose a model, as we come back, hopefully as soon as possible, um, still support our teachers in knowing the model that we are imposing is going to create a more challenging environment um, than maybe the other model. So we chose a model that supported our, our families and our students, but we know we have to support our teachers coming back as well. So Shannon, let me turn it back to you to just add any thoughts and Melissa, you can add on as well. Sure, I do wanna just clarify um, one piece. Uh, the model that our members overwhelmingly wanted was to have all of their students back in person, uh, two sessions, the AM and PM. So overwhelmingly what they wanted to do was be in person with their students. Um, and the model that the district picked was um, a little less uh, in-person time uh, for students and more time online. So I just wanted to, um, to flesh that out a little bit. Teachers did not want the disruption factor. Uh, but they were willing to experience the disruption factor because they wanted more time with students physically on campus. Uh, I also want to round out one other point. Uh, what's unique about this current situation and why we pivoted so quickly from uh, discussing the model to us accepting the imposition and moving to a demand to bargain is because we are in crisis. So under normal times, uh, it is not uncommon that we experience conflict like this, but our go-to is to create a work group to pull in um, principals and teachers and parents and student perspective, get all of that information on the table, try out different theories. If we have enough time, try out a pilot, try things on, see what works and then refine. So that's normally how we handle differences of opinion. We recognize that during this crisis uh, and at the time um, or, or the, uh, the date that we are expected to go back in hybrid is January 5th. So as you can imagine, there is no time to do our normal steps uh, to work through this conflict. So we are rational and can understand that unique times call for unique responses. So um, rather than taking our ball and going home when the district decided that they were going to impose. We immediately let them know that there are certain things that we are going to need to consider. Um, as Melissa addressed earlier, um, you cannot implement a system that is going to crush your workforce and think that it's gonna be kid, uh, good for kids because it won't be sustainable. So we, uh, let them know what a lot of those things would probably be, but also let them know that we would need time to go back and have further thought and dialogue with our own members around what things we would need to consider. Um, sort of the last point on that, uh, the reason that we are still in conversation 
uh, with each other and uh, are feeling optimistic that we're going to be able to work through this difficulty is really, it's, it's been um, very heartening and continues to build trust that both Kent, Melissa and his team have been extremely responsive to the demand to bargain. So even though we have moved into a little bit more formality than the process that Melissa had described uh, about how we've been navigating this crisis so far, um, they did not say, well, we're gonna impose and we can too bad. It was, we understand that this is going to have a negative impact. So let's hear from you about what you need. And that genuine inquiry and interest in meeting the demand, it does not mean that we have solved everything yet, but there is an earnest effort from the district to understand the interest inside of the demand to bargain. Um, and we are making progress. Some of them are already resolved. The other ones are in progress and we have a couple that we're still working through, but that continues to show us uh, as the you know, leaders of our association, but also our members that uh, we are in unique times. Uh, the imposition is not what we wanted, but we know we have to um, figure out a plan to make sure we're all back January 5th. And the district has demonstrated responsiveness in hearing our, um, our interests. Thanks for that, Shannon. And Tom, we'll turn it over to you uh, just to be sensitive to time as well, if there are any questions at this time. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciated that. Um, Ms. Kent and I talked about, right? We, we've been working on this campaign and then this, this particular issue came up, right? And so we reached out and said, everything's not perfect, right? Ken, how, how, you can, how can you talk about this, right? How, how can we talk about it? Because things have gone so well. And that, that's an overstatement, right? We recognize that, you know, the, the work that goes into that. And Ken said, no, this, this is, we want to talk about this because this is how we work through issues and we this is when our relationship will be tested and we want to be able to still be able to show that this is part of the process so i really appreciate both kent and, and shannon taking the time to kind of help us all with that right and to see the realities of that um, with any kind of partnership right there are times where there's you know there's things that you don't always agree on but it's the commitment to working together right to find agreement i, I think that's the most important so um, just want to thank you for that too and really thank Michelle too but I'll turn it back to to our, our board president uh, Nalo and let him uh, take on the questions no thank you Tom and and thank thank you Kent Melissa and Shannon this I, I appreciate so much the highlight because there were so many lessons learned there I mean I, I really appreciate Shannon your call out to the norm the distinction between how we operate and normal and how we're having to operate now, I think is an incredible highlight, as well as the principles that guide the behavior, that there has to be agreement around how these, what these principles are for how we uh, conduct ourselves. Kent, I love the message that you sent uh, around the, the energy and the commitment it takes to cultivate the culture that's needed um, to work in this current state. Uh, and Melissa, I, I highlighted the simplicity of it, but the keep things real statement, was uh, perfect because sometimes we forget and we overcomplicate things. And there's a lot of lessons there. I I'm gonna turn it over to the board for just comments and any questions that they have. But from my perspective, just really appreciate the highlight and the lessons that you're bringing to the field uh, around how hard it is and how much commitment it takes to do the work right now. Uh, board member Lyon. Thank you, and thank you to Kent, Shannon, and Melissa. Um, I have learned a lot from uh, you all over the years, and I've been at many different presentations, and every time, and even today, I've learned something that will be a good takeaway, so I thank you for all of that. Um, and I do really appreciate showcasing how difficult uh, this climate is for our districts and our bargaining units to come to agreement. And, and the one thing I just want to say as we all think about how this is working in different districts is you are one of the highest functioning labor management teams in the state and, and you're recognized for that. And so I think it's really illustrative that you also are having challenges in this time. And so for our partners up and down the state and the districts that we support, um, knowing that they don't all have that relationship um, I, I do hope going forward, we've you know, talked a lot uh, about the Labor Management um, Institute and how we can really use CalMe to help people 
get to this place that you all, all are at so that we can do better for our students. And I really appreciate Shannon's comments about having that be the premise for everybody. We all care about kids. And so how do we help all of our districts up and down the state take that same approach as we go forward? And I just think this was really helpful today. So thank you for sharing your story. And I hope people will watch this and listen because we're gonna have a lot of tough discussions at the table as we go forward. And I hope it's more in Google Docs than at the table um, as we go forward. But thank you very much for sharing. Uh, board member Monroe and then board member Sobrante and then board member Gregson. Uh, just to build on uh, board member Lyons comments, uh, uh, you really said a lot of what I wanted to share. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. I also have benefited from the things that you've shared uh, across the years and across particular sessions. What, what strikes me as a county superintendent who convenes all of the districts in Alameda County and really understanding that the issues that are facing superintendents and our bargaining units are in some districts, I mean, tantamount to the kind of conflict you see during um, a strike or um, some other uh, labor action is, um, is at least stressful. Um, it's, it's disheartening and uh, we know that it doesn't serve our students best. Um, and so really in, in listening to you, remembering that even though we're in, as we all say all the time, unprecedented times, this is not an excuse and perhaps it, perhaps it is an excuse to actually look at making a shift. Um, I think that um, it can be hard to make shifts like this during times of crisis, but it also can be used as an impetus to um, look at things differently and come together in different ways. So um, I think, you know, I think you've really inspired me to uh, actually uh, help to push that because I know we see our LMI uh, emails come through. We see our, we're like, that's great. After this is over, we're going to get right back on that. Um, but this, this actually, it, it needs to happen now. Uh, it, it absolutely does. Because if we're not coming together um, in, in service of our students now when they <laughs> need it more than ever, um, I don't know when it will be more important than this. So thank you. I appreciate you sharing the, the, the great, uh, you know, the bad and the ugly as well. It's, it's all part of the picture. You know, Sandy said in the last item that I think it was, I, I won't quote you exactly right, Sandy, but you talked about weaknesses showing up and gaps showing up um, now more than ever. And I think the same is true with labor relations. So you you really hit that in, in your comments that there we need to find this as an opportunity to build together rather than showcasing and, and separating us even more. So appreciated that comment earlier, Sandy. Absolutely. Thank you, Board Member Lyon and Board Member Monroe for the thoughtful comments. Board Member Sobrante? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's just refreshing to get this type of a presentation and to really see uh, the true partnership. And, and I, I like the analogy about, you know, it's not one side setting a proposal, it's the other side countering, it's, it's you're working off a of Google Doc. Uh, you know, outside of working in K-12, I, I have the privilege of serving on a local community college board and I'm really struck by the shared governance model uh, that permeates our community college board and a lot of the community college where it truly is a partnership. We throw out that word a lot, partnership, collaboration, but there isn't a committee within our community college district that doesn't have you know, deans or you know, fac administrators, faculty and classified employees working through every single issue. Uh, you know, there's always, a, you know, it, it's just a different model. And I, it's it's refreshing to see that at San Juan. And, you know, I think as we look at this LMI work uh, moving forward, I, I really do think that's such important work because fundamentally we're in the people business. And we could talk all day long about let's implement this reading program or let's implement this math curriculum or this type of pedagogy. But at the end of the day, the core human relationships you know, that is really what's going to drive success so many times. And so many of the uh, areas of where there's challenges, it's because some of those human relationships between labor and management uh, haven't been able to work through those issues together. So, you know, as you said, there's challenges. You're facing them right now in, in San Juan. Every district's going to have them 
It's not always going to be perfect, but the fact that you have that shared governance mindset and approach, uh, I think is, is really refreshing and, and a model and, you know, just really uh, excites me about the importance of working uh, on this even more through LMI and, and maybe we can get a, a, an update on that at a future meeting. So true, board member Sabranti. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board member Gregson. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of your hard work and the complexities of your work together. You know, seeing across the state to all of the districts and how they're approaching their reopening and the external push and pull that is also happening, it is extremely important that the internal relationships uh, that you have established are together working um, collaboratively, as you said. You know, you there's a neighboring district that the that the pandemic has amplified the gaps in the teacher administration relationship and the students, and I'm a parent of one of those students, are, are really seeing the impact of that. So I can appreciate very much, not only as the chief deputy superintendent of CDE, but also as a parent, that you are paying attention to the internal relationships because they, they matter. They matter for our kids. And so I really appreciate your honesty and also your due diligence in working together, ensuring that you have the relationships needed to make sure the families are connected and your students are being served. So thank you. Thank you. That was well, well said, uh, board member Gregson. That their relationships do matter for students and we often forget about that. So thank you so much. Um, if there's no other comments from the board uh, or questions, I'd like to go to public comment. There yes, we have one public comment actually from uh, Mr. Ed Honowitz from the California Labor Management Initiative CDE Foundation. Great. Ed, you should be unmuted if you'd like to address the board. Sure. Um, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to speak at the uh, at your meeting, uh, and uh, I just wanted to really acknowledge the uh, the really important, powerful work that's happening in San Juan around labor management partnership and. Uh, you know, especially the fact that it's it's focused on joint problem solving and student success. Um, we've worked with San Juan on a number of levels. Uh, we've had them present at multiple California Labor Management Initiative uh, convenings. Um, I'm, I'm the project director of the California Labor Management Initiative, which is a part of the CDE Foundation, by the way. Um, and uh, I think the work in San Juan really helps people to see both what is possible and to give them examples of, of the actual mechanics of how do you struggle through the challenges of really developing deep partnerships. Um, the work that we do with the California uh, Labor Management Initiative across districts in California really has kind of three pillars of, of collaboration, trust, equity, and communication. And I think the work in San Juan is really an example of all of those coming into play as they struggle through trying to uh, work together and problem solve in this extremely challenging time. Um, so I, I really appreciate the work that um, is happening in San Juan, um, the leaders there, um, and then, you know, likewise, I think the fact that CCEE is focused on this issue of labor management partnership, I think is really, you know, important because we see it as really foundational to district improvement. Um, and so lifting up these kinds of examples is, is important, and we look forward to continuing to work with um, with you, with uh, other uh, elements of the state system of support to provide um, some capacity building around labor management partnership. And uh, again, really appreciate both San Juan's uh, excellent work, uh, as well as CCEE um, making this a, a foundational element. And we will be in touch around the work we're doing with the 21 CSLA and other pieces of the state system of support and look forward to your partnership with you. Leanne, is there any further public comment? Thank you, yes, no um, further public comment and no call-in comments as well. Great, thank you, Ed, for your call-in and your comments. We appreciate that very much. Um, and uh, Kent, Melissa, and Shannon, we can't thank you enough for carving out time in your day to share the work that you're doing and engaged in in San Juan. And Tom, I'll let you close with any last comments before we move on to our next item. 
Yeah, no, I appreciate you thinking, Kent. And, and I know when I reached out to Kent originally around this, it was during the pandemic, right? And I'm like, hey, can you help us, right? By taking time out of the, your really important day. And he reached out to his team and said, sure, right? So this is a really, it's a gift for all of us, a gift of their time, a gift of their experience. And it's really what our campaign is all about. Our Comeback California campaign is specifically to try to highlight and lift up the examples of folks and, and particularly focused around collaborating right? And the importance of collaborating right that's unique to our name right and so we are we're intentional about trying to think about how are folks collaborating during this time um, to be able to do what they can to make you know to, to get through this but also create learning environments that we know are conducive for kids too so um, I want to thank Michelle in particular for all of her work around this. We do have some upcoming highlights. We have Lindsay Unified that we're, we're doing some work in right now and we've been doing, have um, quite a bit of experience and has been a leader, I think, across the state around distance learning in particular. And they have more of a unique model that's a little more of a site-based model. So we'll be looking for that as well as we have uh, other members of our advisory committee and, and who have reached out to uh, have some other examples too that we'll you'll see our highlighting. So I encourage you to look. We just actually updated our our Comeback California webpage yesterday too. So I encourage the board to kind of take a look at that and then uh, keep an eye out for other some other upcoming things that we think will be helpful as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tom. That uh, will close item three. And we'll move on. This is a portion in our agenda where we move on to item five, the adjustment we made. And Tom, we're at the hour and a half mark here. And I know we're behind schedule, but I also am um, sensitive to the reality that I believe those presenting in item five are on a tighter timeline. And so we have two choices. We can take a two minute stretch break for the board uh, and come right back and then take a larger break after item five, or we can power through item five and then take a larger uh, break. We're, not knowing where our presenters are in their time, maybe you can give me some thoughts. I think we can afford two minutes. I don't know. We can afford too much more. Is that they are they are on the schedule too? So if we, if you're comfortable, okay. I think we could do a comfort break and then get right after it because we do want to. We, we can appreciate them giving okay. us. Okay, board, are you okay with a two minute just stretch and we come back? Okay, we're good with a two minute stretch. So we'll adjourn for two minutes. Uh, we'll be back here at. 1033. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, welcome back. Thank you. That was quick. I know, board. Uh, I appreciate it as we've gotten behind just a bit and we had some tight, tight timelines for our presenters for item five. So that brings us to item five, the CCEE Advisory Council uh, presentation. This is also information discussion. And I will turn it over to Suji Shin, Deputy D Executive Director of the CCEE. Great. Thank you, Chair Navo Board. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this item. Um, just giving um, folks a, a reminder and overview of our advisory council, which was set up in 2016, and has been meeting about four times a year since then. Um, the focus of this body has evolved over time, but get to the next slide. They have been um, key advisors, thought partners, and communication supports for CCE. Um, you know, over the past year, we have engaged with our advisory council in engaging in feedback and input into the new direction of our website um, to be more resource focused, to be easier to navigate, to interact. Uh, to be more interactive. Um, we have partnered uh, with the department, state board staff um, to provide updates and engage our advisory council members around new initiatives like the 21st Century California School Leadership Academy, a uh, new system of support updates uh, and updates to the dashboard. Um, following the shelter in place order earlier this year, we were able to use this body to collect quick feedback on needs, challenges the field were facing, and areas of focus um, that they were engaging in that we could also share with our partners um, at that state level to help shape uh, our immediate next steps. And so this has been truly um, a body for us that we've been using again, sort of really to partner with us, provide ed input, feedback, um, advice um, around uh, developing our next steps and de developing our work plan and shaping this work over some key initiatives of the past several years. Uh, next slide. 
As you see here, the makeup of our advisory council is uh, 22 members. Uh, we have a couple of seats currently open with some of the transitions um, in the superintendencies, um, but we have representatives from each of our the 11 Sasasa regions with a county superintendent and a district superintendent within the, um, each of those regions that are elected for a two-year uh, membership period. And so, um, I am thrilled now really just to hand it over to two of our advisory council members who have been deeply engaged in our advisory council work and whom with um, of whom we count on as key um, kind of members, um, advisors, thought partners in this work to talk a little bit more about their experience as advisory council members, to share with them some of um, some of the benefits that they have felt that they have gained as uh, participating in this body, and then to um, to be that they are, uh, they have any feedback around kind of direction of the council and advice for the governing board in the work of this council. So that said, I'd love to turn it over at this point to um, Chris Hartley, Superintendent of Humboldt County Office of Education, to speak a little bit about his uh, again his membership um, and experiences, and he will be followed by Dr. Christy. Barrett, who is superintendent in Hemet Unified. So Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I hope it's as beautiful where you're at as it is up here in Humboldt County today. So if you're not, if you're not familiar with Humboldt County, we're on the far northwest coast of the state. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous here today. Um, how much time do we have, Suji, so I can keep myself on track? And we have a good um, 10, 15 minutes. All right. So I took a picture yesterday. I was visiting districts and one of our smallest districts in Oric, California, which is in the middle of the Redwood National Park, was covered in elk. <laughs> and I see I don't have the ability to share my screen. If I did, I'd show you the photo I took. The elk were literally in the playground. It was hilarious. So it gives you a sense of the, the breadth of what this advisory council does. And I guess I would share that as my first appreciation for being on it is to have an opportunity at the county office level to represent rural districts in the state of California. So the needs in Oric up there where the elk were taken over the playground um, are very different than our, you know, our urban counterparts, but they're also very similar. And so um, that's one aspect I think I would just start with is the importance of having a broad representation of folks throughout the state of California um, to meet together and network um, with the facilitation being done by CCEE and the, and the great staff there. Um, that, I was thinking about that when I was asked to come share today, I'm like, that's kind of one of my favorite takeaways is that I have an opportunity um, with the context and the experience in the 31 districts that I represent to come and learn from folks throughout the state, but also to have an opportunity to share and advocate um, and to share perspectives that maybe folks aren't aware of um, that exist for us um, in this part of, of the country. And, and those experiences aren't just unique to Humboldt County. They're very similar to rural programs throughout the state of California. So to be able to have a voice to do that with the CCE team, um, for me is one of the strongest values that I get um, and sense of accomplishment and a sense of uh, really learning that goes with being a part of the council. I spoke with, um, I spoke with Chris uh, the other day um, who was one of the organizers for the program um, and asked what was her kind of perspective around the program starting and it, and it aligned perfectly with mine. And that's Chris Frazier, former county superintendent for Kern County. She is a Humboldt County resident, by the way. So we bump into each other quite often. She's retired up here. And she said, you know, really the intent was to bring people together and to build relationships and to broaden the scope and create a network between practitioners um, and between decision makers at the state level without having to go through other channels like AXA or CSESA necessarily, or, or SSDA or other organizations to have a more streamlined connection between an influence between folks that are in the field to uh, CCEE who links that to decisions that can be being made and formulated at the state level. And I'd say we've definitely, we accomplished that in the advisory council. Um, we accomplished that in a lot of ways. One of, one of my most um, valuable participating points of that is we have, serious discourse. Um, I had an opportunity to sit on a, on a little bit of that last uh, presentation and I really appreciated hearing the value of communication and how communication is scaffolded uh, between the superintendent and, and his union representation. 
And I think the same type of model exists for us in the advisory council. We're able to scaffold our communication, but we're also able to really deep dive into um, complex issues and to freely express our opinions and beliefs and to learn uh, a great deal from one another. And the, the end product of that are some conclusions and recommendations that I feel are very strong and very, very well vetted. So that ability to have strong discourse together, um, it's fantastic. And I think it really benefits uh, Tom and his team in hearing that and being a part of those discussions and getting perspectives that might not have otherwise been uncovered um, if we didn't have an opportunity to freely talk and freely share ideas and to scaffold our communication between each other. The other part um, that is important to me, um, just not only in the advisory council, but with our work here is the importance of de-siloing the work in the state of California. And what I found is, is terrific is that if I have a situation or if I'm learning something new or an opinion, I've got access to Tom and his team as an advisory council member. And if I'm hearing things among superintendents or other county office of education superintendents, I can make a phone call, I can send an email and I get a prompt response. I can say, hey, this is what we're hearing in the field. What do you know about this? And it's an amazing link to key folks at the state level to give input, but then also to listen and go, okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then I, in turn, as an advisory council member can relay and network that back out to my stakeholders or to whoever the people are that are giving me input. So advisory council members also serve as a conduit of information between CCE and all the folks that we interact with. I think that's the point. So when I meet with my rural colleagues in Shasta County or wherever else it might be, I'm a link between all of those voices and CCEE and ultimately you all as board members. That to me is super critical. It's a, it's a fabulous pipeline of information sharing that quite honestly is super efficient. One of the reasons it's efficient is because it's trusted. When I attend the meetings as an advisory council member, I trust implicitly the folks that are in the room and the folks that are running and facilitating the meeting. Uh, the CCE team is, is outstanding at, at doing just a tremendous job keep, keeping us informed. But oftentimes we, we lack perhaps like, mm, you know, is this really going in the right direction? Do we really trust what's happening here? And I just have to share the way that this program has been set up for the advisory council. I have full trust in the process that we're engaged in. And that helps me be completely genuine and, you know, um, an open um, and a, a good conduit for that type of communication you know, that we have with our stakeholders. I think also it's important to share what are the resources that I, am, I have as a representative on the advisory council from a county office perspective. The school-wide system of support when this first rolled out was a complicated thing to say the least. Lots of confusion, lots of confusion among county office of education superintendents, quite honestly, on how it was designed. How did this come about? Can we have a seat at the table? And I feel the advisory council and working with CCE is allowing us to be more on the forefront of those type of systems as they're being designed in the future. With that said, being a part of this council gave me an opportunity to relay the structure of the system of support to my districts that I serve and other rural superintendents to find and to be able to show people how they can engage in it, what the structure looks like, how you can do the most important thing, access it. So that it's not just another uh, diagram or another, you know, um, another component to what we do with all of our educational institutions, but it's an accessible system. And there's places that the County Office of Education support it. And there's places that CC supports it. And most importantly, when the opportunities arise, there's ways that we both can intersect and support it together. And so um, I think that resource um, has been tremendous, not only to me as the County Office, but for districts um, who are tapping into that. The other resource I believe is the connection of input through CCEE to CDE and to have that um, access and to be able to share thoughts and opinions and know that it can ultimately get to folks that need to hear it is really uh, reassuring to me. Um, and it's essentially that networking that allows us to, um, I guess, give input that can get in front of key decisions that are being made. And at the end of the day, decisions are being made at the state level and we might not always agree with them, but if at least we've had an opportunity to give input to them and are aware of the process that's happening before they're being made, we can generally live with the outcome. 
It's when there's suddenly a decision or an outcome and we're like, where did that come from? We never even had a chance to give our perspective. They have no idea what the rural context is around the decision that was just made. What is going on? That's when the problems happen. And I feel that my role on the advisory board has allowed me to get ahead of those things and to at least give my two cents and to represent rurals you know, in that context. So to just kind of wrap up, because you got Christy here and she's, she's got some great things to share. And I, I love serving with Christy um, on the advisory council. We have some tremendous <laughs> discussions. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but moving forward, I, I guess I was, I was like, what is one thing that I could see CCEE helping us all with throughout the state moving forward? And I really think, you know, you're, it's, it's a real fortune that they're connected in so many ways throughout the state of California. And one of my biggest goals is this post-pandemic planning is really where my team has shifted. I mean, we're dealing with the day-to-day -day crisis. I was on the phone as you guys were having your last conversation with the public health director, dealing with some issues that are happening at this very moment in Humboldt County. But we're also planning ahead. How do we take the things that we are creating and innovating right now that are just absolutely thrilling to think about? How do we make sure those innovations move us move forward into the future so that as we come out of this crisis, we take the incredible learnings, the incredible programs that we're developing um, here locally for me, the relationships with all our other public agencies is one example. How do we make sure we take those best practices and apply them in a post pandemic world? It's one thing I think CCE might get their head wrapped around. And I know that you're, you're capturing all of those great things that are happening throughout the state. If you just look at the, the communication between the district and the association in your last presentation. What are those things that are allowing them to function at a high level during a crisis that we can just apply to when we finally get back to normal, the normal grind? So we don't lose those practices. I think, I think CCE is well positioned to help us throughout the state to garner what those best practices are and make sure we move, we use those as we move forward out of this pandemic. Um, that's a goal for us here at the county office. And I know uh, we are not in this alone. So um, I think having CCE help us with that at the statewide level will be a fantastic asset moving forward. So um, thank you so much for um, having me here with you guys this morning. I appreciate it, Suji. And um, I know you have Christy here to speak as well. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. Um, and with that, uh, I know I'll just, I'll turn it directly over to Dr. Christy Barrett, who is uh, again, one of our um, advisory council members uh, representing our district membership body on this board. So Christy, I'll hand it over to you again to share with our board just some of your reflections, thoughts, and guidance uh, around the work of the advisory council. <laughs> uh, thank you, Suji, for the introduction. And it is just an honor to be here. And it's great to see familiar faces as well as uh, new. And Chris, I, I could not agree with your closing comment uh, more. I have a whiteboard over here where I will often brain dump. And one of the essential questions I've written to myself is how do we move beyond the crisis thinking um, and into the forward thinking? I, I think it's just so critical that, that we do that for our students. So um, with that, I think what, what I'll start with is just giving a shout out to the leadership team uh, of the CCEE, Tom, of course, as well as individuals such as Suji. Um, it is effective because of the leadership. And we know that to be true um, of all organization, that leadership matters. And so uh, in regards to being part of the advisory council, uh, the reason that that is a meaningful space is because Tom not only um, intentionally creates a space where we can have meaningful dialogue, he is also very intentional um, in creating a space that is safe where we can push back um, and at times be sporty with one another, which we, we do that in a very healthy way, knowing that in order to bring about positive change, you have to have the real conversation. Um, and we're able to do that because the leadership and the space um, allows for that to be. And so thank you. And uh, I, I think to that point, um, the value uh, for me personally in being part um, of the council is as leaders, we wanna be in a space where we can influence. That's why we do what we do, right? And, and we wanna influence in a way that brings about positive change and outcomes for uh, the hundreds of thousands of students that we serve on a daily basis. And so 
I um, am deeply appreciative and do not take for granted the opportunity that I have been given to serve on the council. Um, as you saw earlier, the list of names of those that are involved, it's few. And so uh, with that, just very thankful because I do know uh, that it's a space to influence. And I know that the discussions that we have are taken to heart and that they are used in part to make decisions in moving forward and that that uh, feedback is shared. Uh, another thing that I think is very important about being a, a part of that council is what we all know being in the public education space um, is that there's a difference between policy and, and the application of that policy. And so by being a part of the advisory council, it gives us an opportunity as county and district leaders to not only, um, I would think, seek to understand about what policy is, but also what are the implications um, to the application of that? Because even though at times policy may come with good intent, the application of that and the variation that can happen across the state can limit our ability to to be effective. And so the advisory council really does offer an opportunity um, to kind of share and to analyze what is the variation across the state um, and to be able to have some meaning dialogue around that. Uh, I think my final point um, in terms of the value um, in being part of the advisory council is something that Chris also mentioned. Um, and that is the ability just to be um, part of the learning and to be um, able to network and to be with others um, who share in a common um, mission, if you will. Um, I love uh, being with my, my county colleagues, but we understand that what happens in, in one county um, is not maybe what's happening in another county. And so to be able to cross pollinate, um, I'm just like a sponge because we only know what we know um, and to be able to be with other people that are in different spaces whose context is different than our own. Um, uh, wow, right? I mean, it, it doesn't get much richer than that. And so I just, um, I, I really uh, think that that is a key piece of what happens when we are together. Um, in regards um, to an example of a resource that I, we found helpful, and I, I've told this to Tom, I said it um, during one of our advisory councils, um, I'm a little bit jealous that we don't all have the ability to be part of the systemic um, instructional review process. Um, there are many great tools that uh, the CCEE is responsible for creating uh, for us to access um, as district leaders. Um, and of course, beyond just that of the role of the superintendent, but I will tell you that I believe the CCEE hit it out of the park with the development of the systemic um, instructional review process. And my comment um, to Tom um, and to everyone at the, this particular advisory council meeting where this was rolled out was, how do I sign up for that? Um, I don't wanna have to be in distress to be able to access um, and benefit from um, the, the awesomeness, if you will, that comes out from the feedback that we as a district would receive um, from going through um, something such as this. Um, and, and what I mean by that, um, I think, you know, once you're in a, a system for a period of time, you lose the ability to see with clarity, right? You can't see the forest for the trees. You get a little bit nose blind, if you will. And so I understand the why between the uh, the why behind the SIR, but I, I think if I had a wish and I recognize that the staff is limited, it would be able to expand those efforts um, to districts that are positioned uh, to take it and run with it. Because I do think that it's a high leverage strategy that can accelerate change in many districts across the state. Um, if, if, if given the opportunity. And I recognize that there are other ways to bring in external um, eyes, if you will, to give feedback, but um, I will tell you, this is a, a huge win and I just, I can't say enough about it, um, but I'll, I'll stop there. It's a, that's, I even printed it off, like that's a good thing. <laughs> um, and then to bring my, um, my comments to a close, um, any advice that I would give to the um, to the board, 
Um, I, I think what I will share with you is, is what you already uh, know and, and probably talk about on a regular basis. Um, I'll take you back um, to the beginning when we entered into this new accountability system. Um, it wasn't the only thing that was happening, right? We had Common Core happening, we had LCFF happening, we had LCAP happening, we had, we had, we had, we had, the list goes on and on and on. And so, uh, you know, with this new accountability, accountability system, of course, we've now come to the space where we have differentiated assistance. And um, I, I think my advice would be that uh, even though that um, water hose uh, analogy, right, we're all drinking from a fire hose kind of thing, you know, uh, districts and county offices um, were and still continue to figure out what does differentiated assistance mean for us? How do we work through that? Um, understanding that it's not about differentiated assistance, it's about what it means for kids. And so in, in keeping that lens in mind, um, it's just so critical to be intentional in your efforts as a board uh, to get voice from the end user. Um, understanding that our county offices of education are pivotal in leading this work and organizing it um, in a state of this size, but to not make assumptions um, what this means for the end user in terms of us as district superintendents. And so we are a collective team and, and that team needs to extend beyond the county offices of ed um, and also be inclusive of, of the county offices. Um, I think one of the things as leaders we have to be mindful of is regardless of how large the system is, what is the variation? Um, and variation can be positive and it can be negative, right? We, we want to look on both sides of that coin. But as a board, how are we being very intentional and in identifying the variation that's happening across the system? Um, and how can end users potentially help um, be part of the metric um, and identifying what that is? And then as a board, how do we leverage positive variation? Um, and how do we begin to minim minimize or to uh, close the gap, if you will, on variation that we don't think uh, to be helpful um, in our end goal? And so um, that, that, would be, that would be my advice. I think there are many things um, that happen in the state where if um, leaders that were in positions to ask um, for input or just um, experiences of those that are closest to the work, uh, we would be able to accelerate change and to be just more consistent um, in the outcomes that we're able to yield. So uh, with that, thank you again for your time. I'm just absolutely honored and just feel so special to have been uh, selected to come and have a conversation with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, Chris, um, for taking time out of your incredibly busy days, right, schedules right now to share with our board. I think for our board, um, hopefully this has given you a tiny taste of really the privilege that it's been for us to work with this uh, really incredible, lively, engaged, thoughtful group of leaders who have truly helped us uh, shape our work and make our work better. Um, and so with that, Chair Novel, I'll hand it over to you and the board for questions. Thank you, uh, Suji and Chris and Christy. Christy, it's great to see you again. Um, thank you so much for your thoughtful comments. And there was so much, to, I took a lot of notes. So, and I'm sure the board did as well. I'm gonna turn it over to them for any comments or questions. Board member Monroe. Thanks so much. Good to see you, Chris. Thank you so much, Superintendent Barrett, also for uh, your time today. This was an item I was very much interested in. So thanks, Tom and staff, for bringing this to us. Um, so I used to sit on the advisory council before becoming a board member with CCEE. And um, as, as uh, both of our colleagues said, it, the conversations there were extremely generative. And I would have to say, you know, if you uh, know, know much about group dynamics. I would say we were in the forming on the precipice of the storming stage when uh, I was in the group figuring out what we were all doing and uh, uh, really the system of support and all of those things. Uh, but, you know, as was said, uh, it was a space where all of that uh, could absolutely happen. And I, um, 
wanted uh, also for the, not only this board, but for the public to know that, you know, there is a group of practitioners on the ground who are informing this work, um, which is extremely important. And, um, you know, one of the questions I frequently ask is, how is this impacting districts? Because, you know, we know as county superintendents and as CDE and as other places, we have these conversations all the time. And there is often a concern that we might be in an echo chamber. So making sure that um, our districts are really, um, because that's that's what it's about. Uh, they're the the you know closest to our students, making sure that they're feeling the impact. So um, really appreciate you uh, sharing the vital role that you play, and uh, what the advisory council um, is, and uh, how it informs the work of CCEE. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Monroe. Board Member Sobrante. Yeah, I, I want to just, uh, again, echo uh, Superintendent Monroe's comments and thank you for your service. And it's great to see uh, the Advisory Council really finding its niche and working together. And I think there's great mutual benefit uh, from, from the group work. And I think a couple comments, particularly, uh, I, I think um, Superintendent Hartley's comments about the need during this moment in time to capture the best of what's happening uh, to see how that can be implemented moving forward because we went from crisis learning and now we're in various models of distance and hybrid and utilizing technology and doing so many different things out of necessity, but there's so many things that we're learning now uh, that can really inform our practices moving forward. And I think CCE in particular, working through the advisory council and the, you know so many of the other networks we're a part of to capture the best of what's happening right now and to be able to package that and to promote that moving forward uh, when we get back to some semblance of normalcy, I think that it's really important. So uh, I, I really took those comments to heart. And, and Superintendent Barrett, uh, the comment, and, and I've always felt this way, you know, we don't need a district to be in crisis to do that deep dive examination. You know, the, the SIR process is, you know, I mean, it's born out of statute, it's born out of necessity, and we're doing just great work, but, you could have a, a high performing district that wants to get better in a particular area or, you know, any district or any charter that says, you know what, I really want to, you know, work on our EL or foster youth or drill down on community engagement. And, you know, I, I would love to see the day where CCE had those type of strike teams, so to speak, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, that could go in and, and it's not a sir, uh, but maybe it's more like using the wise wasp as kind of the model, you know, WASC is accreditation and that has its purpose. And, you know, for those that go through the WASC process in a reflective way, uh, it, it can have a lot of benefits and not just check the box on accreditation. But, you know, if we utilize that model and really kind of had an approach where CC could go in for two or three days and, and analyze a problem or a couple areas, uh, I know with the LCAP, I mean, that was part of the initial design is, you know, CC, you got the eight priority areas and CC might be able to give some guidance on, on ways that uh, LEAs can improve their LCAPs and improve performance in some of those areas. So I think uh, Superintendent Barrett's comments are really part of some of the very earliest conversations that we had on this board. And I, I don't want to lose sight of that because I do think there's some real opportunities there uh, for us moving forward. So thank you for those comments. Thank you, Board Member Sobranti. Well said, Board Member Lyon. Well, I just want to build on what both my colleagues on the board have said. Thanks to both of you for your insightful comments. And I just want to echo that we can't do this work without practitioners input. It, a system of support has to be built on what's practical, what's doable in districts, and what will move that needle. So I really appreciate you, both of your perspectives from the county and the district level. And I appreciate my colleague here in Riverside County, Superintendent Barrett's comments about um, the idea that each of our counties is so different and it is something that we all have to be so mindful of and having come from LA County most of my career to Riverside. Um, I've seen that a little bit, but I really do appreciate the variety that um, that our staff's working with to really make sure up and down the state we have all of those regions represented and you're able to bring that local perspective to the conversation. I think that's important. And then the last thing I'll say, because I don't want to be the board member, I caution my board members all the time, don't repeat what everybody already said. So I'm going to try to hold true to that. Um, what I really do appreciate, though, is that a system of support that is successful and is really moving the needle for our students 
isn't going to be one that is dreaded by the people who are receiving that support. It's going to be something that's embraced and wanted and needed. And I really appreciate um, what Christy said about the idea that when you're as the advisory team hearing about the work that's being done, you want to access that. So kudos to all of the staff who are creating those processes, the programs, the services, because that is how we will ultimately impact uh, education up and down the state is by creating a, a, an improvement process that folks want to jump on board and have, even if they're not in crisis, even if they're just seeking to be in that continuous improvement mode. So that really is to staff for all the great work that you're doing out there. Thank you for that. Thank you, board member Lyon. Those are really important comments. I appreciate that. Board member Gregson. Uh, yes, thank you. So I'm going to say ditto to all of my board colleagues and what they've said, uh, but I do have a question for you, Superintendent Barrett. I believe Hemet Unified is the largest district as far as square miles is concerned. Is that correct? That's correct. We're just a skosh under 700. <laughs> yes, I, I remember that little tidbit about Hemet Unified being the largest district in square miles. And so the challenges and the perspective that you bring to the advisory council is very unique and appreciated. I really appreciated also, Superintendent Hartley, what you said about not making decisions in isolation. And you're coming from CDE and being part of the CCE board, it is really important that we are listening to our end users and the boots on the ground as far as how we can best support your work and the impact that you are having on students. So I just wanna reiterate everything that my board colleagues said and say thank you very much for your expertise and your time. Thank you, board member Gregson. Um, I'll just end with, uh, before we move to public comment, well, thank you again, Chris and Christy for your thoughtful comments. I think you've underscored the importance of the advisory uh, council to network, uh, represent your respective stakeholders, and engage in deep problem solving, which, which uh, promotes honest, brutally honest communication about the needs of the system. So I appreciate that very much. At this time, we'll move on to any potential public comment on this item, Leanne. Yes, we have not received any public comments forms for this item. And just checking, and no calls have come in for this item as well. Okay, there being none. Uh, Suji, any last comments before we close this item? All right, no, just a thank you again to um, uh, doctors, uh, uh, Dr. Barrett and Superintendent Hartley, and then just to our advisory council overall. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll close that. will bring this item to a close again, Christy and Chris. Thank you again for your time and energy. Thank uh, you everyone. To present to us. Take care. Can I, make, can I make one quick comment before we, I, know yep. too. I, I want to thank Christy and, and Chris as well too, but I also really wanted to make sure that I thank Stephanie and her team too. When, when they were referencing, you know, being able to have input, most of that input is really coming to Steph and her team there. We've had, you know, folks come and share what's happening, changes with the dashboard before they've been made, right, to get input. They've come on the LCAP, you know, in particular. So they, they're they actually a consistent member at our uh, at our meetings, always coming and asking for input. And so it's really their leadership that's really pushed that piece because those are, those are not necessarily places where we have influence. We have influence because of our partnership with them. Um, so I really appreciate their leadership in particular around that. And then, and, uh, and I will say it here, I, and I, somebody once told me, be careful what you say in public, right? And, because you'll be held to it, right? But I'll say it here, we will get there, Christy. I promise we will get there at some point to be able to provide more resources, in particular around trying to be more proactive. I loved when we presented the, the sir and Christy's like immediately raised their hands. So like, I want that. I want now. I'll sign up for it. And I'm like, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. Very well, thank you everyone for the comments on that item. That was very informative. And that takes us to item four. Um, we were going to take a break. So board, are, Tom, are, are there, are, is there anyone waiting on this particular item for us? I'm wondering if it's worth giving the board a little bit of a, giving them a five minute break. We have about an hour and a half of content left. Suji, I know we have a few guests. Are they, do they have, do they have time commitments? Um, I think we do. We have two sets of guests for the next one, but I think a five minute um, kind of break is possible and probably well needed. Okay. 
then let's do that. Let's take a five minute break. We'll be back at 1115 and we'll have an hour and a half left. Thank you, everyone. Great. Well, welcome back. Uh, I apologize, board, for pushing us through this. I need to learn to under promise and over deliver <laughs> on these items. But uh, let's uh, take a step back to item four. Uh, this is distance and hybrid learning resources, continuity of learning playbook updates, field guides, and distance learning consortium hot topics. So there's a lot here. And so I'll turn it over to uh, Suji Shin, Deputy Executive Director of CCEE. And board, this is an information discussion item only. Great. We do have some items to share, but I'll actually hand it over to Dr. Carla Estrada, co-executive director, to uh, start off the conversations with our distance learning consortium hot topics. Carla. Thank you so much, Suji. Um, so board members, as you well know, we have been trying to be as responsive and as quickly as possible responsive to the different needs that our LEAs, our county offices, and other partners have shared uh, that resources are truly deeply needed in. And so uh, what Suji and myself hope to be able to share with you today is what have we learned from those experiences and then being able to say, so what are we bringing forward in the future to be able to be a resource and help? And so uh, one of those partners that we learned from over the summer, the spring and the summer was our distance learning consortium. And so I did share with you a handout on some of the impact data. And what we wanted to be able to understand from that impact data is really what was, who was accessing our resources, but also more importantly, one thing that we learned was and in what way are they accessing our resources? And what we found is, yes, we can have these immediate webinars that certain people can access at a certain period of time in the day. But what we really found uh, important in that data was that they're coming back after those sessions are done to be able to access those resources. So being able to, uh, on, the, on the moment needs being addressed is something that we need to be able to continue to be able to offer. And so from those consortium uh, uh, webinar sessions, those lessons and units of studies that were created, we've been building some new resources that are going to be focused on hot topics. Can we have the next slide, please, Leanne? And so one of the key things that we were thinking about, so why should we keep developing these kinds of distance learning resources? Well, as many of you have shared today, um, have reflected in your own work, you know, capacity building and distance learning still remains. This has been a big shift for all educators. I know myself, it's been a big learning curve in trying to understand from platforms to types of learning modalities, what's the best way to do that and understanding the diverse needs of our students and families. Um, as well as our educators. So it's been definitely, there's an ongoing need for capacity building. We also need to share successes. There's some educators, teachers out there that we are fully aware are doing some really innovative, but also responsive uh, educational practices that they're using. And so uh, how can we share those successes in learning? And also knowing that, uh, as we know, certain communities, I'm in LA County, uh, we are shutting down again. And so how do we ensure that schools are able to transition from distance learning to hybrid learning or back to distance learning? And there have already been some districts within our counties that have already been doing that. And so how do we share that? And so our outcome really with the next focus of um, distance learning hot topics is to develop grab and go resources for districts and school educators on these types of uh, topics that are really um, relevant to them. And I'm glad to be able to have uh, our ability to share with you also a little spotlight on one of these hot topics. And so we have Dr. Key Ria Key from San Diego County Office of Ed. Um, uh, Olympia will be sharing with us um, some of the more specific details that will be coming out in the next few weeks. Next slide, please, Leanne. And so what will be those hot topics? So based on our engagement, listening, learning, we've been able to identify a couple areas. One, needs still remains in supporting the diverse needs of our students. And so we will continue to build on what we've learned around English learners. CDE has been putting out some excellent resources across the topics I'm gonna to highlight, but we also wanna say, okay, then where, as people are implementing, what can we learn? And so we wanna leverage some of those and our county offices have been a great partner being able to learn from them as well. So English learners is one area. Uh, Latinx, African American, American Indian students are another group that folks have been sharing that it's a, a hot topic that they're trying to figure out how do they ensure that distance learning is really uh, meaningful for them. 
And then we are also going to have um, Kern County, who's going to focus more on quality distance learning. And their focus is going to look at how do you personalize learning, leveraging synchronous and asynchronous learning and assessment to inform teaching and learning in the distance learning world. As we think about mitigating learning loss, uh, this personalized learning aspect is something that I think we've all talked about as uh, a really relevant way in teaching and practice, but what does that look like is a whole other experience. And so we look, hope to learn from our Kern County partners as they share their learnings with us. Next slide, please. And then we'll be partnering with Orange County, um, who will be sharing with us some of the work they've been doing around multi-tiered social emotional learning and mental health through distance learning. Uh, they have some resources and guidance that they would be sharing with others around the needs of students. Uh, and also very importantly, the social emotional learning and mental health for our educators. And so for the adults in this space, what, what have they also been learning to be a resource? And they've been partnering with folks like the California, School Psychologists Association to get some learnings and understanding from them, um, and all through an MTSS lens, which as we think about uh, students returning back to school and how do we balance that, uh, understanding the, the impact and the, how MTSS can really help both on the social emotional side as well as the academic side is something we're really excited to learn from them on. The next group is uh, supporting and engaging, oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, support, thank you, Leanne. Supporting and engaging families in distance learning. This is where San Bernardino is not only our lead in the community engagement efforts, but also as we think about distance learning, they um, have some strong practices that they will continue to share. They're, we're also moving to being able to translate these resources. That was one piece of the feedback we got from the first one is uh, for these family related resources, how can we have a grab and go where uh, districts could have those resources that are already translated for them and so that way they could use them in practice. And so uh, we're building our capacity to be able to do that and we're grateful for the partnership with San Bernardino to be able to make those resources statewide available. Next slide, please. So as you know, we um, use certain principles in our design from the lesson plans we created in the spring to as we continue to do our work now. And so I just as a reminder, um, wanted folks to know that these are, this is an approach that we've taken since the original design of the consortium. It's something that we hold ourselves accountable to. The counties, I'm so grateful of their always ongoing reflection of how they're incorporating these principles into the work they're designing. Um, and it'll be something that as we continue to partner together, we will always hold um, close to our design of the work. Next slide, please. So what are the actual grab and go resources? So it'll be a set of videos. Um, they will range from some things that are more of an hour type uh, resource to little short snippets. It might be 15 minutes, for example, around a particular topic. So again, people can grab and go and need it for their, use it for their own professional learning that they're doing within their own districts. It might be an educator who might wanna use it for themselves and their specific topics that they receive maybe in uh, some grounding in their own district or in their own county office and they wanna dive a little deeper, they can be able to grab some resources and go deeper if they'd like. And then they also include some toolkits. So some things that um, the team, uh, we were very clear that things that folks can start implementing tomorrow. As a teacher that always warmed my heart that there were things that I could just start using tomorrow. And I think if we can create those kinds of toolkits that include a lot of those types of resources, that is our aim. And so it'll have a combination of these types of resources for each of those hot topics. And they should be with the support of Dorcas on our team and the county offices. Our aim is to get this out as quickly as possible. And a lot of the resources have already started coming in. And so our aim is to be able to package them and get them ready on our website in the coming week. Next slide, please. And now it's my honor to be able to spotlight one of our um, ongoing partners, San Diego County Office of Education and the Distance Learning Consortium, and in particular, Dr. Kiria Kiedis from San Diego County. And she will dive a little bit more into the details around what we're developing for our most diverse and most marginalized populations. Olympia? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity and the honor to present to you today this uh, exciting project. Next slide, please. So we know that um, this pandemic has had disproportionate um, impact on our different populations and that we have all been seeing the headlines and we know that this disproportionate um, impact is, is carrying through into our education of our students. Next slide, please. 
uh, for this project, what we really wanted to hone in on, on four specific populations, African-American students, Latinx, American Indian, and English learners. And we have worked closely with our community partners, um, groups like the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center, the NAACP, Californians Together, different groups are, of community partners to help us better understand this impact that uh, this pandemic has had on our populations as well as um, having a direct contact with our families. We've used our parent liaison networks to do empathy interviews and to seek to understand the perspective of our families. And we've done student panels for each of these populations as well, where we've heard directly from our students. What has the impact been for them and what is the experience they're having um, in, their in being educated during this pandemic? So with that information, we tried to design toolkits with a lens of each of these student groups um, to bring forth resources. And we know that there's an abundance of resources, but we've organized them through the lens of these populations with specific examples uh, that would have a direct and important impact in increasing outcomes and improving the experience for these students and their families. Next slide, please. So each of the toolkits are listed here. Um, and they're, they're uh, documents that embed many resources. And uh, what we're really doing in this project is trying to help this toolkit come to life. And, and as Carla shared, be very useful and practical for the practitioners to be able to start to implement things right away, but to have those layers there for them to keep coming back to and, and referring to and um, revisiting as they master different elements and, and seek more resources. And so each one of those documents are layered here, these toolkits. And if we can go to the next slide. The project deliverables, again, are to bring these webinars, these short webinars forward that help this toolkit come to life and really highlight those key essential um, elements that are really important through the lens of each of these groups um, to help meet their needs in the moment as we heard directly from the families and the students and our community partners, what is really going to help us now with our instruction, with our engagement, with our outcomes, with our social emotional needs, with all the different components, um, but with that heavy emphasis on that instructional piece. And then, so for each one of the groups, the African-American group, the Latinx group, the English learner group, and the American Indian group, we have a webinar that really helps this document come to life with those essential uh, takeaways. And then we have um, designed an overall podcast that um, speaks to the importance of having that strong equity lens uh, for, our for our historically marginalized populations in distance learning. And as we move into you know, hybrid and in-person learning, just the importance of meeting the needs of um, understanding and seeking to understand and to address and to design to, to um, fill in the gaps for these different populations so that we really can improve their outcomes and their experiences in the moment. And then there again is this toolkit that is a resource that is continuing to uh, evolve and to be improved as um, we organize resources into one space through the lens of each of these populations. Next slide, please. And so this is an example of what the doc, some of the components within each of the documents. So there's uh, one toolkit for each population and for each of the populations we have, um, we guide our educators to think about the importance of communication uh, with, this, with your diverse communities and through the lens of each community. In this case, this example is for Latinx community. Um, that there's different typologies of Latinx students and how do you seek to communicate and, and engage those families and those students and uh, continue to do that throughout this process consistently and so on. So that's one example of just one of the components here is communication that's throughout each of the toolkits. Next slide, please. Having that strong equity lens and expanding that equity lens that social justice issues are, have been very clear 
and that we you know, need to think about how to engage with culturally responsive and relevant instruction, how to have those assets oriented environments where students and their families feel welcome and they see um, their, their different strengths celebrated and their cultures addressed um, in the instruction and the experience and the environment that we're designing in a distance learning space. Thank you, next slide. And of course the instructional piece. So we have embedded many tools, just as Carla shared, that embrace those important principles of UDL and MTSS and the supports that are needed. For English learners, we have strong guidance around how to really bring forward comprehensive ELD in this space that we are advancing both the linguistic and academic outcomes of our English learners um, that those that guidance, those tools, those examples are there for teachers and, and, and educational leaders to, to address and move forward in redesigning or designing um, their instruction to better address and meet their needs. So there's, um, again, so many resources out there, but what we've done is really try to organize them for the different populations and try to um, ensure that we have strong examples and, and uh, takeaways for educators to implement right away that will help improve those outcomes immediately. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we are really designing into this toolkit is that yes, we're designing this for this moment in time, but we want to make sure that we are bringing forward the importance of having that strong equity lens, understanding the diversity of your community, of your families, and that within each of these historically marginalized populations, there is diversity there, that there are different typologies that we need to understand the needs of our communities. We need to understand the experiences of our students and their families deeply and design for those experiences and to continue to improve and iterate so that we strive more and more each day to better meet their needs. And that we take this opportunity also to, um, to think about how much we have moved forward in certain areas with distance learning and digital learning. So that even past, as we lead beyond this pand pandemic and we lead into the future, we um, continue to move forward with the lessons learned in in online learning for students and, and educators and, and what opportunities there are, as well as the challenges we've had to address, what have the opportunities been and how can we continue to progress in making sure that we continue to move forward in, you know, in building global competency and the skills needed for our students and educators to thrive um, in the future. So that this toolkit isn't just necessarily for this moment, but the lessons and the things that emerge from this are something that we hope will move through this pandemic and beyond. And there's a quote here that I've included from Hugh Vasquez in the National Equity Project. Since we know that disturbance is required for change and there is no doubt that disturbance is happening as we speak, the question is, are we willing to use this opportunity to create the kind of system we want? And that's a little bit about this project and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Olympia. Um, and so I, I don't know if we would like to stop now, uh, Chair Navo, uh, to discuss this and then before we transition to some more of the resources that are being brought forward um, around this support. Sure, sure. It's a, it's a big item. So how, how about a, just a quick pause and sure. any clarifying questions that the board may have? Uh, board Member Gregson. I just have one quick question. How are these materials and toolkits being marketed? and communicate it out to ensure yeah. that all districts have access or knowledge around them? That's the next phase. So as we're packaging them right now, it through our system of support, obviously that's one place we'll be sharing them um, and through some of our social media pathways. I think um, one of the things we learned from the distance learning consortium was how do we make this the most easiest to access? Because I think some of the things is that we were trying to also in the first round of consortium materials, uh, there were so many different entry points. And so hence why this time we decided let's package it all onto our website so people just have one place to go. 
Um, so as soon as that's clear, I think then we can use some of our traditional uh, communication pathways. But um, I welcome any other ideas as far as, uh, especially from the board, uh, any other pathways that you think are useful. You know, we have our AXA partners, we have, you know, um, the FESA partners, so on and so forth. So our aim is to go through some of those paths. But if there are others that you suggest we take, we welcome that. Great, thank you. That, that was a great question. It was on my mind, uh, board member Gregson. I appreciate the question. Any other uh, clarifying comments, questions from the board for Olympia or Dr. Strada? Okay, Olympia, that was very helpful. I really like the quote. And I love that those are so shelf ready for people to use. Um, incredible work uh, on your behalf, your team's behalf. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you very much. Carla, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And so now I'm gonna transition over to Suji who will share uh, some of the work that we've been doing to build from our continuity of learning playbook. And uh, as we transition to some other resources that folks have asked uh, for us to be able to be supportive in. Suji. Thank you, Carla. Um, and uh, hi again, board. Um, excited now to really share with you uh, the launch of our field guide for accelerating learning, equity, and well being, which is the latest in our kind of uh, package of resources to support continuity of learning for our schools and districts. So, next slide. Um, so, as a reminder, as we think about the evolution of this work, uh, we started out, if you remember, in the first part of the sort of pandemic in the early uh, summer, late spring, in really um, focusing on um, the continuity of learning playbooks. Um, and with those resources, we focused on really thinking about how do we help support LEAs in maintaining a focus on teaching and learning during this time following the governor's stay-at-home order, and really thinking about these practical approaches that schools and districts could use to support distance and hybrid learning. Then from there in the late uh, summer and kind of in the early fall, we transitioned to the health and safety guidebook, um, which uh, in response to a request from the state board and working with the governor's office um, and our public health uh, officials, uh, working to create a, a single site for uh, school and district communities to access all of those disparate resources and guidances around ensuring health and safety for schools. Um, during that um, work, we really introduced some of our multimedia tools and focused on resources to support communication and decision-making for LEA leaders, um, especially tools that could be immediately turned around and used in the field, uh, whether it be a letter to send out to community following a school closure because of an outbreak um, or a PPE calculator to support the planning for safety measures on campuses um, or guidance around how to to think about safe cohorting as we brought students back onto campus in small groups. So we're now in this space with the field guide on the right, um, is thinking of preparing for a launch um, in uh, developing this, what we're calling the field guide for accelerating learning, equity, and well-being, where we will be really focusing on guidance and resources that leverage some of the best practices that you know, you've been hearing about to date um, and lessons learned from expert practitioners in the field. And for those who are ready, really uh, focusing on how we can support the reimagining of teaching, learning and engagement, uh, especially for uh, supporting our most vulnerable student populations. So with that, I am really pleased uh, to uh, introduce our um, uh, two of our partners, our at Copernicus Solutions, uh, Dr. Nicole Assisi and Dr. Uh, Daniel Assisi. And um, they, Copernicus Solutions are, uh, are uh, partners who have we, with whom we've worked um, with the, uh, starting with the playbook and through the health and safety guidebook. We're excited um, to continue this partnership. Um, and we've invited them to share a little bit about the approach and what we can anticipate in the coming hours, weeks, and months as we launch the uh, field guides. So Nicole and Daniel, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Suji. It is a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Thank you for taking the time. I just wanna say, first of all, 
thank you for the continued trust and how great it is to be able to work with such a talented and forward-looking team at the CCEE. Uh, it's been really a, a, a pleasure to be able to continue this evolution of, of the thinking and, and try to help to provide resources for this post-pandemic uh, planning that we were just talking about in different items here as well. We're gonna go to the next slide. Uh, if that's okay. And, um, and we want to say that uh, we, we fully understand that there's many pressures placed on LEA leaders everywhere during these past eight months, um, but you know that we still see uh, uh, the need to look forward. And so the CCEE asked us to, to start thinking in, on how can we uh, help folks curate, curate and sift through so many resources uh, that make life easier for leadership teams to, um, to navigate the, the, you know, what, what is ahead. And of course, we understand full well that you know, while uh, you know, uh, leaders have been extremely busy during these past months, there is still a need to make sure that all our efforts are centered on eight state priorities and that we build on the existing structures uh, that have been established for us with the LCAP, with the continuity of learning and attendance plan and, and single site plan. So as we try to curate these resources and bring to light uh, all the wonderful work that different practitioners and researchers have been doing through the state of California, we want to make sure that we were talking to different partners uh, and working collaboration with different educators throughout the state and beyond to leverage and to find quality information that would be both relevant and useful so that teams could use it on the here and now and on uh, uh, you know beyond the pandemic as well. So we are really thrilled to be able to, to offer this, uh, this different take on, on all this many different resources is trying to make uh, th this vast amount of information that exists out there easy to understand uh, for very busy leaders who are dealing with incredible challenges uh, uh, nowadays. And so the question of the moment is how can we bring those, those information together? How can we make it meaningful and easy to find and help uh, teams prepare for a post pandemic world that leverages the best practices and all the lessons learned uh, from uh, 2020 and reflect some best in class thinking to, to help us move forward. So, so let me pass that to Nicole to um, have her uh, share a little bit more about how we are going about doing this and what's ahead. Thanks, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving us the space to share about this new tool that you all have coming out. Uh, I think what makes this truly unique is Tom mentioned this um, uh, a little bit earlier in your meeting about the fact that when you try to find high quality resources, it almost feels like a rabbit hole, right? Like you get sucked in from like link to link. I, I see Sandy smiling, like, yes, like we've all been there, right? And you're like, I'm almost there. I know it's just like two more clicks and I'll be at this right tool. Well, well we wanted to take that guesswork out uh, for leaders and leadership teams. And so our team actually went through and uh, spent an insane amount of time really clicking through all these links to go, aha, like here are some of these golden tools, right? Like here are those things that are really, really helpful and really curated them. And so not only did we curate different tools from various consulting firms, um, there's some great tools from WestEd in there, instruction partners, uh, really great stuff, but also curated really great things happening across our state at county offices and districts. So we had a chance to talk to folks like Frankie Escobedo um, to sort of say like, okay, how are you managing this pandemic? Like you seem to be smiling a lot, Frankie, like what are you doing right? And so had that information. And then we also re uh, got really great information and resources from, from organizations like CTA NEA that has great resources, AXA had some amazing things, and uh, also looked to what the CDE has been putting out, uh, great stuff on uh, different pedagogical strategies, English learners, and we try to bring it all into one place. And it was really important, as you see in that middle column, is that the content could be dynamic because tools are evolving. When we worked with you all back in March, and when we first went into distance learning, folks were like, we need some sample schedules. We thought, 
ah, who has sample schedules? And everybody was like, I, I don't, do, do you? And so a lot of those things were created, but as time has passed, there have been more sample tools. And so because this field guide lives on a website, it's really dynamic. There are editable documents that folks can just download that we can update on the back end so that the end user has a consistent kind of user experience, but uh, the tools don't get outdated, right? There's not this like, it's a PDF, you print it. Now what the guidance has changed. Um, and I think the last thing that makes this tool that you all have coming out really unique and why we loved working on this is because our work always has been about like, what do folks need right now on the ground, right? Like I've been a system leader, a principal, I've been a classroom teacher, like that work is hard, especially like coming out of November, going into October, I can't imagine a job that is harder than like being in a classroom right now or teaching students. And so how do we use that mindset of like, wow, folks are working incredibly hard and the work is so important and everybody's at a different level, right? Like, I mean, Chris was talking about the fact that he had elk on the playground. Like I used to live in Los Angeles. I can't imagine a scenario where there would be elk on my playground uh, or now in San Diego. So how do we take that in mind though that people are in these different scenarios? And so we created multiple entry points. So for the tool, people can tune in to a podcast and get information and hear from uh, a leader across our state, whether it's Michelle Bowers, like about what she's doing in her district or uh, hear how uh, Diana Kitamura is uh, doing these community assessments to figure out what resources exist. Then they can watch a video, right? They could see somebody like Pedro Noguera talk about equity in education and what research says. They can also say, hey, you know what? I think I just want a tool that I can print and work on with my team. So there's a Google Doc that just has reflective questions that an LEA uh, leadership team could just print out and talk through and work through. Uh, and then there's a whole facilitation guide to really reimagine and dream about what education could be. And um, all of this exists across all the various sections. So if we go to the next slide, you can see the 12 domains that exist. The top three um, we uh, are really about supporting conditions. You can think of these as sort of like triage mode. Like I'm really overwhelmed. Just help me figure out like, how do I communicate, create a schedule and make sure everybody's healthy and safe, right? Like that is like, if everybody's safe and you've communicated with folks and you have some sort of schedule, that's like level one, the supporting conditions. For each of these, like I mentioned, there's podcasts, videos, printable tools, as well as kind of best practices and uh, resources. And you'll get to see it live in a minute. As Suji mentioned, this tool is going live tomorrow. So uh, the next level down is really focusing on outcomes. And we know that um, there are really three types of outcomes that as educators, we're really worried about right now, right? They are the well-being of our students and our staff. Uh, their equity and really committing to what equity means in 2020 and beyond. And then there's accelerating learning. How do we go? I, I just, you know, I think NWEA just came out today saying like, hey, good news, learning loss isn't as bad as we thought it would be. However, it still exists. And so how do we support learners and how do we do that? And so there are multiple entry points here, uh, ranging from math, to K3 reading as a mom, that's what I'm digging into right now with our first grader, uh, you know, how do I support him? But uh, lots and lots of tools. And then uh, rolling out and continuing to roll out will be these best practices. How do I leverage and really lead forward in this time? Uh, that is the first one that is out. Uh, coming out over the next couple of weeks and months, we'll look at and dive deeper into supporting all staff, uh, redefining skills for success, right? Like what do we know? What has research taught us in this current time about what is most critical for students moving forward? Uh, how do educators work through um, various modes of teaching? I love, uh, you know, Kern is already working on like, 
asynchronous synchronous but there's more right there's like asynchronous synchronous digital analog like how does it all fit together and what's the research um i know our state board president linda darling hammond is working on some powerful research on just how blended and hybrid learning can be incredibly effective right and so really sharing those best practices and then empowering parents uh something great that i think we can all agree that has come out of the pandemic is just the closer connection between um, the all the adults that are involved in kids' lives, right? Parents and educators. And so, how do we leverage that? How do we learn from what is working right now? From you know, a lot of superintendents tell me like I used to do a parent meeting and I'd have five folks show up. Now on Zoom, there's a hundred, right? Like, how do we remember these lessons as we reimagine? Um, and the way we do that is by offering folks just tools that they can lean into this work at whatever feels comfortable for them right now, because every single educator in the state right now is doing their best, right? Everybody's working incredibly hard and every community is a little bit different. And so there's no judgment on like, oh, you're in distance learning or you're in hybrid learning. There's like no gold star for one or the other. It's just about figuring out how do we give folks easy entry points to get tools? You need an email to staff, click on seamless communication. Did you know that LACO actually created a bunch of template emails? Like we've curated them for you. Uh, oh, you need that in Armenian? Guess what? Like we have that for you. Um, oh, you want a schedule? Um, for hybrid learning, uh, well, do you want to go one week on, one week off, or are you doing an A-B schedule? We've got sample schedules for both of those, right? And so it's really figuring out how do you get people what they need in a timely fashion. So if you go to the next slide, it'll give you kind of an overview of what each site looks like. You don't need to read this. You'll see it in a minute, but each section has a why, a what, a how, Right, like those three things, like, why am I doing this? Why is this important? What, what, what does research tell me? What exactly am I doing here? And how can I do this work? Um, you know, there's a lot of information on these slides. So at the top of each, there's a bottom line. Look, if you don't have time to scroll through the whole page, here are two tools for you to start with. You want more tools for choosing a model, we give a call out for that. And then on the bottom of each site, just some questions for reflection because that's where the learning comes from, right? It was like Dewey that says like learning doesn't come from doing, it comes from reflecting upon doing. Uh, so that's really important and we wanna honor that and kind of use best practices. So with that said, um, if we go to the next slide, I wanted to point out to you that the CCE now has a leading forward podcast. Um, one of the folks on there is, is Frankie and you know, come on, his picture just looked really great. But, being held up by kids, right? That's uh, so well suited for him. Uh, you'll have a podcast that you can sign up for. It's launching soon. And so uh, hopefully whether you are commuting from your home to your office or from your bedroom to the kitchen, you can put this on and hear what's going on and hear from some of the amazing leaders across the state. Um, let's hop over to the website. I was told that we might be able to do that, Leanne and that uh, Daniel, I think, is our victim for, for navigating us through. Is that right, Daniel, or am I doing this? I can certainly uh, jump in. See, the, the secret is Daniel has like six monitors. I just have one, so I figured it's all happening. And then uh, we'll gladly take any of your questions. Um, but I thought, uh, if Daniel finds the, the website. See, one of the challenges with having too many, you have a very tidy though, like very many things on your desktop. Oh, so I, I think we are going on the wrong desktop here. You were talking about my many desktops. See the challenges, Nicole? I do, should I? There we go, there's the there field guide. Go. Fantastic, so when you come to this site, uh, the website is fieldguide.cce-ca.org. Um, you'll navigate to this page with um, awesome students on the right hand side. Um, and as you slide down, the first thing I want to point out to you is that when you land on this site, again, the goal is to get people to engage at levels that feel right for them. 
this button right here on top in the middle, the dark blue one, it says, if you don't know where to start, click here. And it's basically a personalized planning tool where you'll be asked 10 questions. And based on how you answer those 10 questions, you are emailed resources because sometimes you don't want to click through a whole website. So you click on this, answer the questions, and the CCE then emails you uh, resources such as like, hey, here's the sample letters, or here is where you find the example schedules, or you're looking for a change management tool, here's a link. So that tool is right on top. Then you get to these three health and safety communication and flexible schedules. The next we're sort of asking folks in the dark blue um, rectangle across for a, a protocol to engage teams. And then let's kind of dig into um, one of these sections. Daniel, how about we go to schedules? Cause I know it's on everyone's mind of like, what does that look like when our kids back? How do they come back? And so what you'll see here um, is bottom line. Look, if you're, if you don't even know your options for schedules, uh, the bottom line says do now click on the AXA report. AXA put together a really great report that talks to you about all the various scheduling models that are there and it takes you right to it while still keeping open because my pet peeve is like when windows close and then I have to hit the back button forever. So the original field guide stays open. You can just click back to it. You're like, okay, that's, that's there. Now you've got the problem of too many tabs open, but uh, this, this too shall pass. It then takes you through various considerations. Under the how, you'll notice there's sort of a quick drop down to take you to any other section. But Daniel, why don't you take us, let's pick one of the scheduling models. It's a little small on my side, but if we go to the, let's say your district, ha, you know, your North Star, your vision is to really focus on your at-risk youth and that you want a sample schedule for that. Well, if you click right here, we've curated a sample schedule that comes from ERS under the second bullet right here. And it is a sample schedule on how to set up a schedule that specifically targets your at-risk youth first. And so um, looking for students with the highest needs. And in this model, it's a whole PowerPoint that walks you through, you know, what are the grade spans that you could serve? How many staff members do you need? Um, what, you know, what are you looking at in terms of FTEs? What are some considerations? How do you set it up together? And then what does the day look like as you go down on this? So this specifically looks at, you know, if you have 20 students with special needs, how do you divide them up? Um, how do you use your speech language pathologist? What does period one, two, three, and four look like with your various cohorts? Um, so anyways, again, just something for folks to go, oh my gosh, I can totally plug in my kids, right? Like if I, if I have X number of students here is how I plug them in and use them. Uh, if you go back, Daniel, to the scheduling um, consideration, I wanna click on, I think if you go down a little bit, there is a sample schedule from Grossmont that we got, Grossmont High School, uh, that was really great, um, that offers, oh, it's so small, where'd it go? That's all right, it's somewhere, but there's a whole, Grossmont did an excellent job just really thinking through, you know, how do we put our students into groups? What does our daily schedule looks like? What is sort of the arrival and dismissal procedure? How do I walk students through campus? Where do they go? And so again, like lots and lots of great resources to really let folks know. Uh, one of the things Chris and Christina, uh, Chris and Christy said is that you know, they believe that when you go to a CCE resource that you can trust it and that, you know, it's like asking a friend for advice. When our team um, is putting this together, the lens that we often use with superintendents is if a fellow leader calls you at nine o'clock at night and says, I got to create a schedule and I need to show something to my labor partners tomorrow. Or, you know, I want to send out a letter to parents, like help me, how do I leverage sort of input and voice? You would give them something and you would point them to something rather than saying, well, let me, you know, let me tell you some research about why parent engagement is important. It's like, if I call you late at night, you want to point me straight to that resource. And that is the goal of this field guide, get people directly to the information they need, give them samples that have been created by thoughtful leaders like themselves and put it in one place to make it easy to navigate. So um, would love to take your questions. Suji, I'm sure, 
I was a little nervous and really excited that this is coming together. So I think I may have left some things out. Daniel and Suji, help me out. Um, what else did I fail to share? No, no. I mean, it, again, just really thank you to Nicole and Daniel for this. I think, boy, you can see this, uh, the field guide. There is a lot in there. And um, it, it is an incredibly robust um, tool that is continuing to evolve and we'll be continuing to work on in the coming weeks and months as we um, receive additional input and um, guidance uh, and support LEAs in making some of these critical decisions. Um, you know, as Nicole and Daniel said, the focus of this work um, is really to think about what are those best practices and tools that we can get into the hands of our LEA leaders immediately so that we can cut down the burden for them somewhat. Um, that said, you know, there's a lot in there because a lot of these next steps for our uh, schools and districts are really to think about this, um, this much more difficult work of reimagining teaching and learning. You know, it's not just, I mean, not that it's not just, but you know, we're moving beyond kind of switching over to the digital learning space. We've kind of moved beyond kind of closing and reopening of schools. And now to truly think about what does a classroom environment look like when you're not in the physical classroom? What is what does school look like in 2021? And so we couldn't be more thrilled to be working with Daniel and Nicole and their broader team. I can't express sort of, you know, the late nights, early mornings, I mean, just I'd say like even last night we were, we were encountering some technical issues and just to get a sense of um, the, the way that we've been working. You know, my last texts and emails with Daniel and Nicole are I think three in the morning and then we picked it right back up at five o'clock and they were doing work in between that time as well. So I'm thrilled that we got it up here to be able to show you and we're very excited to be able to be um, kind of launch and show you more um, in the coming weeks and months. I don't think a 15 minute presentation could have done it justice at all. And so just hoping to give you a tiny taste uh, what we're hoping to be able to share with the field. Yeah, that, that, that was absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I can't wait to dive in and uh, Daniel, Nicole, we so greatly appreciate as I echo uh, Suji's comments, your partnerships. Um, I'm gonna open it up to board members for comments and um, questions. Uh, board members, Sprante. Yeah, no, excellent presentation, really exciting. I love that you pulled the best of the best from so many different groups. So, you know, starting with CDE, of course, but all the way down, CTA, AXA, you know, Successa, you know, there's so many resources out there. So pulling the best of the best, putting it in one place. I love the fact that it's, you have multiple modalities. I love the fact that it's plug and play. Um, I, maybe this is more of a question for Suji or Tom, but like what, what is the rollout? Because I know at various points, you know, when we first put out the very first playbook, you know, and you know, we've, we've had a couple different iterations. This is next level building off the great work that's already been done, but this is at a whole different level. So what is our plan to really roll this out there? Because I really do feel so many in the field can benefit uh, from these resources. Um, I think we want to be really thoughtful about the rollout approach and really think about what is needed when um, we're anticipating a series of rollouts. So, it, you know, we're not going to be waiting until everything is completed to do a big launch or, you know, big webinar, but really starting tomorrow, getting tools into the hands of schools and district leaders immediately, being thoughtful about when we provide opportunities, kind of weigh in, um, receive consultation support. Um, I think as Daniel Nicole said, there is a lot in there, just even not just the tools themselves, but the guidances, um, you know, kind of podcasts, multimedia um, supports that um, that we're hoping to really use in a much broader way to help get to that kind of that bottom line piece, especially right. So for those who are um, needing something immediate, how do we get them sort of uh, quick and easy support for those who want to dig in deeper. How might we um, provide additional opportunity to kind of come in with their team and really explore and enhance the work themselves. So again, you know, over uh, we're anticipating that over the next several months, we will have a continual um, sort of series of rollouts um, to kind of continue and re-engage in that conversation as new items are coming up and new needs are identified in the field. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, board member Sobranti. Any other board members? Oh, board member Monroe. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. This uh, 
as someone, as a county superintendent who was involved with CCE at the very beginning and, and remembering the process of uploading resources to this kind of, you know, uh, cavernous place and uh, not really having uh, any way of um, easily finding them. This is the absolutely a natural progression. It's um, a, a great evolution to see. Um, and I think that just also speaking for my fellow board members, it's something that comes up often. How do we get these resources to the field and how do we make these resources that CCE has been developing over these years really accessible? And I think that you have um, taken a huge step at 3 a.m. and at other times in, um, in getting this done. So uh, I really appreciate that. What I'm um, wondering, and, and I also think that this is part of what you said too, was a good connection with, um, I think the advisory council presentation about how do we take the learning from this particular time and make sure that it um, has you know resonance beyond the pandemic and that we're taking those best examples and uh, implementing them. And I think that what you're doing is gonna help bridge that for sure. Um, I'm, my uh, question is, how, how are you finding these tools? So is it word of mouth? Is it, um, you know, uh, one thing leads you to another thing? What, what uh, uh, you know, I, it feels like you're leaving no stone unturned, but um, there are just so many resources out there. So uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I it's a little bit of sort of networking, asking, there's sort of like a science and an art to it in some ways. We interviewed about 50 different leaders and subject matter experts uh, across California. And then just really called our colleagues at other firms and said like, what if you, if you could only share one thing with me, right? Like what's the one thing that you feel like really is most accessible? It's uh, asking superintendents, what are you currently using or what do you wish you had? And then just really searching and looking. And um, again, it's going down those like clicking rabbit holes where you're like, maybe there's something here. And when we can't find it, it's, um, you know, it's emailing folks. Like I was just on the phone with Aaron from the San Diego County Office of Ed. And I said, I really need um, a, a schedule for high school that does X, Y, and Z. And she said, let me, let me reach out to my network, right? And so it's utilizing all the really, really smart folks that are in California already and that are doing this work rather than recreating something. I think that's what's so brilliant about the CDE, right? It's not about ego and just creating something to put like your logo on it. It's about figuring out like, how do we take what's happening? How do we leverage county offices? How do we leverage what the CDE is doing? How do we leverage like CTA resources? Like all these things that are out there from AXA and others, and how do we shine a light on them? So people just can find them more easily without having to do so much research. So it at times was grueling work. It's really exciting to see it come together. And um, so pleased that you all see the value in it and that you uh, invest your own time and energy into CCSA, uh, CCEE, because I think you're, there's, there's some magic happening here. Fantastic. Thank you, board member Monroe. Any other questions, comments? Board member Lyon. Uh, just thank you for your presentation. It's good to see Nicole again. I tried to hire her many years ago away from her current job, and I'm glad she's actually impacting the whole state now. So that's great. <laughs> um, my question, I really think this is an amazing tool, and I always try to, you know, I was a one school uh, superintendent principal, and so I just want to make sure as we think about getting this out that we also think about those um, those places that are gonna really need the resources, they don't have people and they really will need that guidance and, and uh, layers of information that they can access. Uh, my question is, are, are we going to update this regularly and how will it be updated? Because as everything with COVID-19 and distance learning, we're evolving and we're learning and things that we think are great right now may not be great in three months. And so I just wonder what the plan is for that. Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, across the spectrum of our resources in this kind of continuity of learning portfolio, we've been um, part of the baked into the project planning has been uh, kind of refining, revo you know, re, uh, reinvestigating and reinvesting in the work. Um, and I just, you know, I think part of, um, you know, Member Monroe's question as well, like really 
continue to take feedback, not just from the field, um, but through our advisory council members and through our partners with the, the LEAs that we're working closely with and the direct technical assistance work, really getting a better sense of what's working, what's um, what more is needed, how best we do we take the resources and tools and reshape them in a way that can better fit the kind of the immediate needs of the field. Um, and then really thinking about over the long term, um, what will those needs continue? Because one thing I, I really think of now, and um, my colleagues may feel the same way, when I go to something and I see that it was written about the co uh, about distance learning in May, I'm not so interested. Um, I really want to see stuff that's current. And so I think you can, we can keep interest going if people know we're looking at it, we're updating it, and then we're pushing it out again with those new iterations. Absolutely. Those are great comments. Thank you, board member Lyon. I'd agree. Any other comments? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we'll open up for pu any public comment on this item. Uh, no public comments have been received and it looks like no calls have been coming in for this comment as well. This item. Okay. Okay. Well, again, uh, on behalf of the board, Nicole and Daniel, thank you for all your incredible work, Suji, and your incredible work on this. It's a heavy lift and I'm so excited for the field to be able to have access to it. I think it's going to uh, really serve a purpose and I couldn't agree with board member Lyon more about the evolution and continually enhancing the, the products that are available. Um, I'll, cl I'll let uh, Suji or Tom any last comments. Okay. Um, none other than um, again just uh, what a thrill it has been to work with our partners at Copernicus and how excited we are about uh, the continuing evolution of this work. And we're excited to continue to share with you all as the work evolves and grows over time. And um, please be on the lookout starting tomorrow, that first segment or our first launch will happen. Um, and over the next weeks uh, and months, we you will be hearing regularly from us as we continue to build it out and expand upon it um, for the field and we're excited to launch it out officially. Yeah, the only comment I would have is, is really would encourage the board members to give us feedback. So when it comes out, look, go look at resources, say, Tom, helpful resource, not a helpful resource, right? We need more of this, less of that, right? So that we can make sure that it's targeted. And that's the uniqueness about our board, right? We have Tim's perspective, right, as a teacher, and we have County Stoops, and District Stoops, and other folks too. So we, we really do need your help with that too. So if you could dig in a little bit, once it's out there that would help us so that we can continue to make it fresh and, and make sure it meets the needs of the field. Right, fantastic. Well, that was a wonderful item. I uh, appreciate it again. And that'll close item five and or item four and take us to item six. Uh, RTI systems of support evaluation and results. This is uh, information and discussion and I will turn it over to Ronnie Jones. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Navo and um, our board members. We're very excited today to be able to present to you some um, of our evaluation preliminary results from the system of support evaluation that we have been um, leading with our partners. We have another partner with us today, RTI. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we did have a few of our RTI partners, uh, Dr. Rodeman and Dr. Wisnitsky, uh, have to sign off because they had other meetings. We're running a little behind. So um, Dr. Feldman is with me today to really present um, the results. We'll be trading off back and forth as we go through the slides. And um, I think that we would like to start just first, um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, by just reminding you that the system of support is a network. And so all of the research that RTI has been conducting and the evaluation that they have been doing is really grounded in the idea that this network has uh, specific qualities that will make it more effective as it begins to grow, as it grows and develops over time. And so what you're gonna see today is you're gonna see evaluation results, uh, preliminary results reported about how the state agencies are collaborating with each other and across the system, uh, as well as data related to the geographic leads and the SELPA leads. Those three elements of the evaluation are most similar and it makes the most sense for us to present that data to you today. You might also remember that we have some evaluation 
results for the community engagement initiative, but those results are different statutorily. They're structured, uh, the uh, CEI is structured in a very different way, working directly with LEAs to surface best practices. So today our report is really gonna focus on the system of support overall level, the geographic leads and the SELPA leads as we move into this. You'll also notice that this graphic is a little bit out of date. We're in the middle of updating this graphic. So we just didn't quite have all the feedback from our state partners and our lead agency partners around this graphic to include in the presentation by the posting deadline. But we are working on a system of support graphic that will include 21 CSLA, both of the educator workforce investment grants, and then obviously the literacy grant, the dyslexia grant, um, and any of the other new um, lead agencies within the system of support. So if I could have the next slide, please. So one of the things that you're gonna hear throughout today's presentation is about the approach that we've taken to this evaluation. So you don't have to raise your hand, but many of you have been involved in maybe outside evaluation projects before. Um, you may have been involved as a subject where somebody from the outside, maybe somebody like LPI, maybe um, some other researcher from a university calls you up and conducts an interview at the end of a project after the project is over. This evaluation that we're doing with RTI around the system of support is very different. RTI has been embedded with the system of support for the last year as they have been developing many of the elements of the system of support. So what you'll see is that RTI was selected specifically because they came to us uh, with a proposal that was really grounded in formative assessment that will help the system of support improve over time and improve in real time. These are not results that are just re reported back at the end of the year with the system. These are the our RTI team has been engaged um, monthly with uh, the geo leads, the SELPA leads, many different elements of the system of support. And they've been getting feedback from the members of the system, including the state agencies and lead agencies around the research questions, around the theories of action, around the, the evaluation tools, such as interview questions and surveys that are be, being used. Because the one thing that we really want is we want this evaluation to be usable. We don't want this evaluation to be a report or to be a white paper that is posted online or put on a shelf in a binder and nobody ever looks at it. RTI actually will talk a little bit about the fact that they just got done with a series of meetings with the geo leads. Um, going over the research questions in the research plan coming up for next year. We spent two full meetings with the GEOLEADS going over the results of the evaluation so that they could implement the learnings from the evaluation and really um, improve the work. Also, this uh, evaluation is unique because uh, the state agencies are using this to really hold ourselves accountable. If we're expecting others to improve, if we are expecting others to focus on equity, that really is our, um, our goal as well, is state agencies working together in this collaborative environment. And so we're excited to, um, to welcome Jay Feldman today, uh, who's going to be presenting with us. He's going to talk a, a little bit about um, uh, the approach. He's going to talk about the methodology. He's going to talk about what RTI brings to the table. And then he and I are going to switch back and forth talking about some of the data points that we have at this point. So Jay, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, yeah, so the next slide kind of has some nice icons on there. We just, we did want to just talk about what our approach is and Ronnie did a really great job of kind of um, actually sharing what we, with the standards that we hold ourselves to in our work and how we, how we working with CCE and the state partners and the lead agencies. We just think it is really important and you know, we're doing a formative and summative assessment, um, but we really take the formative aspect of our role very seriously. And we do believe that if we're gonna collect data, that data has to be useful for the people who are in the system. And it has to be useful for them to really think about what it is that they're doing and how they can improve their work. Um, which also means that as they're improving their work and they're changing their work based upon the data that we collect, we need to be responsive to them because what they need in one month is gonna be different than the data they need um, during our next data collection because they would have changed um, some of the work we're doing. So we have a real strong iterative process um, with all the lead agencies, state agencies, and the, um, the lead partner agencies as well. So that's part of our equity frame that we, we, we bring to the work too, is making sure that the stakeholders of the project really have a strong say in what's going on and, and what the research questions are and how we're collecting data and what that data is. 
But the other part of our equity frame is really um, focusing on the impact of the work, especially focusing on the impact of the work on marginalized groups. Um, so, you know, we are thinking about not just thinking about that in a couple of different ways, right? So there's the group of students and the marginalized communities that um, California is serving. So we want to understand and always hold up um, as what is, what is what is happening? How is that going to have differential impact for the students that you're serving? Um, and so that helps guide the way we think about the questions and the way we think about data collection and analysis. We also are holding um, an equity frame to not just the students, but the, the COEs themselves as well. So there's very differential under needs for a rural district versus an urban district and a small district or a small COE and a large COE. And there's different equity issues involved in their work and their interaction with the system. So we keep that in mind or we as part of our frame. And then finally, that kind of leads into that we do have a systems frame and we know um, that we think about how the partners and the policies in the system and and um, that their that their needs are going to shift if we're going to have to if we're going to have different results. So we focus on the inequities that we're seeing in the system. We focus on um, collecting data that can help provide feedback for partners in the system to be able to act on it to address and disrupt those inequities and create new new pathways, new policies that are going to um, address those inequities. So that's kind of our guiding approach and what we're trying to hold ourselves to. And um, the next slide is kind of the model that we're using to evaluate the network. So this comes from um, Fullen and it's it's similar to frameworks from other researchers as well about what are the elements of an effective network. Um, and so an effective network, if you're able to implement these six practices, you're more likely to be able to um, have positive impact on equitable outcomes. So the way we think about the research is, you know, is collecting data on these practices, on, on these elements of the network, give us a good indicator of, is the system moving in the right direction to improve student outcomes? So knowing how, how the system is doing in continuous improvement or how it's doing in terms of their collaboration together, those are foundational elements that are needed in order to move the needle on student outcomes. So it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, uh, I should remember the research term as a researcher, but it's it's kind of an indicator of whether you're getting to the, those ultimate outcomes, right? Because we, we're not going to see change in student outcomes in the first you know, month or two months or six months. But if we can see change in the practices and the quality of the practices here, you're more likely going to see those positive student outcomes um, as the system strengthens itself. So kicking into the data that we're going to talk about on the next slide. Um, so we're, we're, as Ronnie said, we're going to present data on just a part of what we, we collected this year. And um, this slide just shows we did a number of surveys to the statewide and lead agencies to um, where it says geographic lead agency county offices of education staff. So that was a survey to the COEs that were being served by the geographic leads. Similarly, the SELPA lead agency survey there is SELPA staff that were being served by the SELPA leads, SELPA COE staff being served by the SELPA leads. Um, although we're not talking specifically about the community engagement district um, initiative, in this meeting, some of their data is being used, uh, was analyzed in the open-ended questions that we, we did analyze and we are presenting. Um, and then we did a survey of county offices and education superintendents. And I just kind of wanted to point out that this data is older. It's from the beginning of the year. Um, most of those surveys were done as the, as, the, as the pandemic was beginning. And we'll kind of pepper our comments with what we're learning from some of the qualitative data collection that we did in the spring, this fall um, to show where this, how the system has moved from where it was based upon this snapshot a couple of months ago. 
Yeah, Jay, and as you transition to the next slide, I do want to just uh, thank RTI. As you could imagine, conducting surveys and interviews at the onset of the pandemic and trying to really access educational leaders was just a Herculean task, and they were um, incredibly uh, patient. We adjusted our timelines many times. We had um, incredible cooperation from our um, our partner lead agencies, as well as our uh, state agencies in um, being able to collect this information at a very difficult time. Yeah, I wanna echo the support of the lead agencies in helping us collect the data and the folks who were on the ground who were giving us feedback. I got a lot of emails um, when we send our email out saying about the survey out saying like I can't do this right now but I really want to get feedback and so there's a real strong um, desire for folks to see the system work um, and so it, it was um, I think our survey response rate was I should remember this as well it was 65 to 75 percent depending on the survey. yeah that's right um, so that that's a pretty strong indicator that people were really involved or invested in what's happening um, so again, this slide is just saying we're, we're only going to talk about these three initiatives. Um, so we can, and Ronnie kind of talked about that already, so we can move to the next slide. So here's some results. Here's what we're learning. So when we're thinking about the system of the poor, what we're really talking about is the relationship between the lead agencies, CELPA, CEI, um, geo lead agencies, and the statewide partners, CDE, SPE, and CCE. So what we found was that the, the foundational elements of a successful network from that, that framing that I shared earlier are pretty strong. Um, state agencies are fostering trusting relationships and increased collaboration. Those, um, those relationships and that collaboration are really necessary to, to build a foundation to doing deeper work, right? Without trust, people aren't gonna come to you with their real challenges and so you're not gonna really be able to address um, where, the, where the inequities are in the system. The next slide talks a little bit about some areas where um, we saw where the network could grow back when we were collecting this data. Um, and here we're seeing that some of the infrastructure and roles clarity were rated a little lower back in, in January and March, 2020. Um, and that kind of makes sense as trust is being built and um, the foundations are being built um, people are trying to clarify their roles, and if you're not sure exactly what you're doing, um, if you're just figuring out what you're doing, it, it makes sense that some of this is a little bit um, lower rated. And I think what we're seeing, and again, in our, in our interviews this fall and in our observations over the spring is that there's been, been changes, right? So peer rating connecting to resources was rated a little lower, but through the pandemic, the geo leads and the self leads really came together and figured out um, with the support of CCE and CDE how to, how to bring those resources together and how to share them out. They had been talking about back in the spring about how do we do a hub and how do we do this? And the pandemic really um, you know, forced them to figure it out a lot faster. So I'm, I'm sure that the ratings for this would change given the learning and the work that they did in the spring. And similar to leadership, um, the leadership finding there about what their what their roles are, um, the the clarity that geo leads are getting, for example, with what they're doing on the ground has been um, they're they're getting feedback on what's working and what's not working, and so as they're understanding what's working, they're having a better sense of this is the role that we should have, and as they're hearing what's not working, either tweaking what they're doing or realizing that that's not what they have, so they have a lot greater clarity. Um, among themselves over what they should be focusing on. Great. Thanks, Jay. We'll move on to the next slide. I, we're going to move kind of quickly through these slides because we know that um, several board yeah. members have hard stops. So just saying that we see similar patterns with the geographic leads, right? Like that they also are establishing trust and they they uh, the leadership of the geographic leads is really being appreciated um, by their partner county offices. And many of you that this statement will resonate with you who um, were here with us as we began to implement LCFF is that the geo leads have really um, found the right balance uh, between having supportive relationships rather than compliance relationships with their partner county offices. So we're very encouraged by that. And if we could go to the next slide. 
Um, and so again, you can see that this theme of curating resources and then collaborating across agencies continues to come up. This is a continual um, balance back and forth of being able to find the right resources as the education environment shifts. Um, obviously we went to the pandemic, this isn't necessarily capturing that, but people were getting a sense that the resources that we had been looking at in the past maybe we're not the ones that they were gonna need moving into the future. And so you can continue to see that pattern. Um, Jay, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump in on the, the SELPA um, data as well. And so uh -huh. I think that the SELPA data for us on the next slide is really the strongest data that we had. The SELPA leads, as you might remember, had been selected because they had an area of expertise related to the specific area that they're providing support in, whether that, that supports for students with autism or universal design for learning. So you can see that they um, actually had very high ratings related to their evidence-based practices and to their resources because it was much more focused. Um, and on the next slide, they really are working hard across the state to develop relationships because, as you know, um, the SELPAs that were um, originally um, selected were much more regional and now we're expecting them to have a statewide leadership role within um, the state. And so that's a different level of relationship that they've had to develop across the state. But as we hope that you can see that that organizing framework that we have around networks is helping us to understand what the foundational growth within the system is in order to help us to, um, to really understand where the strengths are, where the state agencies might be able to provide some support in order to help them grow. And then finally, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll sort of leave you, um, actually, uh, we had this aspirational question. If, if you could have the system do anything, if the system could accomplish anything, what would it be? And so if you could go ahead to two slides for me, Leanne, please. Um, you'll see that there were several aspirational findings that, that individuals within the system really found that having an equity focus within the system of support was something that they felt that the system could really accomplish. How do we have more equitable outcomes for all students? As you might also know that with the suspension of the dashboard this year, that we're missing, we're gonna be missing an element of data, but we're, we're working with RTI and really finding ways to understand what the local data is related to student outcomes in the system of support. But then we can also make sure that we are continually improving the system and that we have resources that are readily available for LEAs. And so I think I'm gonna end there. There are lots of resources attached and there were resources that we were able to share with you in some of the um, slides that uh, if you continue to move through the presentation, but I'll turn it back over to um, Chair Navo if we have any questions. Great, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, uh, Dr. Feldman, that was, that was helpful. Really appreciate the highlights, especially around the geographic lead agency success. That's, um, I really appreciate seeing that. I'll turn it over to board members at this time. Questions, comments on RTI? Okay. Um, board member Sobrante. No, I, I just think it's, I, I think it's a real sign of our reflective practice that we've had them embedded in the process from the beginning. Um, my one question, do we have we asked participants as part of the research kind of the same questions over a period of six months or a year to just kind of gauge from respondents any trends, you know, where maybe people had certain perceptions six months ago or a year ago and now maybe they view things differently. I just I'd be curious about that one aspect. Yeah, so we're we're ramping up our survey administration that's coming up in Jan starting in January. So this would only be their second administration. We will ask many of the similar questions, but also changing some based upon you know, new needs. But we'll yeah. be able to track like you're asking. No, I, I think that's important. I mean, I think the, recent, the, the information is really positive. Uh, and, and again, it goes back to the one theme, just promoting uh, how we get these resources to those that need it. And, and I would say one area that I would really target uh, is uh, I talk a lot about targeting teachers, but I think uh, site principals uh, could also really benefit from some of the from some of the resources or the information, uh, and, and figuring out you know maybe working through a partner like AXA or others just so that awareness is there in the field for how to access the network. But overall, uh, really encouraged uh, results. Thank you, Board Member Sabranti. That was uh, that was well said. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Board Member Monroe. Uh, thank you for this. It's been really helpful to hear. 
uh, particularly as a uh, county office who's a geographic lead. Um, what was interesting to see, Ronnie, was the uh, information about the, I, I guess I'll just say this, the success of the SELPA leads, um, which you mentioned shortly, the thought I was having shortly after is, is that it's a specific or, or focused, uh, you know, um, content um, really helped people to access it, know exactly what they were seeking and what they were likely to get. Um, I think the question that comes to my mind as I understand how different all of the geographic leads are in the way that they provide information and um, kind of the breadth of information and the projects that um, we are involved in is if that's a good compliment to have something that's so organic uh, as compared to something that's so specific that people find really helpful, or if we need to move towards a, a more, you know, thoughtful way of having the geographic leads um, lead. So that's my question. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think RTI has been a great partner in helping us. I think, I can't remember which member talked about this earlier, but in order for us to account for variation, that that's what's needed for local control is variation, right? So how do we understand the, both the positives of variation as well as maybe some of the pitfalls of variation? And I think that one of the things that RTI has done in its, its design of this evaluation is that they're not only um, helping us to understand the effectiveness, but also uncovering best practices. So, you know, it could be, for example, the, the uh, geo lead led by Alameda, your very urban area. And that might take a very different um, strategy that makes that geo lead effective than maybe the one that's led by Shasta because they're in a rural area, right? And I think we don't have any of those trends just yet, but I think that, that this is not just an evaluation, but it's also a little bit of a research project in that it, um, the, the RTI team is helping us uncover some of those elements that maybe are varying by geo lead, but also then are making it more effective in those particular areas. Thank you. Great, thank you, board member Monroe. Anyone else? Any other board member questions, comments? Okay, uh, board member Lyon, did you have a question? I just had a thumbs up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> just quickly, thank again, you. I really am, I'm grateful we're doing this evaluation. I echo what um, both of our other board members have said, and it is important that we constantly look at how we're doing with the what we're doing. And so I appreciate this really thoughtful, deep approach. Thank you, board member Lyon. And with that, we'll move to public comment on this item. Um, Leanne, do we have any public comment on item six? No, we have no public comments on item six. Okay, there be none. We'll close item six. Uh, thank you again, Ronnie, for the heavy lift. And thank you, Dr. Feldman, for being able to stay with us and, and share this, um, the learnings with us and your work. That moves us to our last item, board members. Uh, item seven, modified salary schedules for CCEE exempt professional experts. This is a discussion and action item and we'll turn it over to Marin County Office of Ed. Good afternoon, Chair Navo, members of the board. Uh, Charina Morris, Deputy Superintendent on behalf of the Marin County Superintendent of Schools, Mary Jane Burke. Uh, today I bring forward a rat for ratification, a modified salary schedule for CCEE exempt professional expert employees. As a brief background, the CCE board historically serves to ratify salary schedules for the CCEE employees. The salary schedule modification before you today is in response to a requirement by CalPERS to publish salary schedules that include daily rates to align with CalPERS reporting requirements. And this is as required by government code section 20636.1. The previous salary schedule only listed annual salaries. Consequently, the salary schedule modification before you adds daily rates, which is computed by dividing the annual salary by the annual workdays. With that, I'd like to open it up to the board for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, any comments, questions, clarification from the board? on this item. Looks pretty straightforward. I see none. Um, I'll open it up for public comment before motion. No and public comments have been received for this item as well. Okay. 
So there being none, uh, can I get a motion on item seven, uh, accepting the salary schedule for CCE exempt professional and uh, experts employed by the Marin County Office of Education? I'll move the item as presented by staff. Okay, so motion by Sobrante. I need a second. I'll second. Second by Monroe. And we'll do our roll call vote. Board member Lyon. Aye. Uh, board member Gregson. Aye. Uh, board member Sobrante. Aye. Board member Monroe. Aye. And um, board member Navas, aye as well. Uh, motion moves. Thank you for all your hard work and thank you for making that so um, <laughs> quick and to the point for all of us. We appreciate that very much. That moves us to our last item, item eight, uh, general public comment. Public comment is invited on any matter not included on the printed agenda, depending on the number of individuals wishing to address the CCEE, the presiding officer may establish specific time limits on presentations. This is just information. And Leanne, I'd ask again, if there's any general public comment. We did receive one general public comment from Mr. Tim Taylor. Um, he does not look like he's available to provide this comment, so I'll read it for him. Um, Tim Taylor's from the California Small School District Association. He would like to commend the CCE staff for their incredible efforts during the pandemic by providing schools with great resources and support. I especially wanna thank the organization for their commitment to serving all students in schools, especially small rural schools. They have made a concerted effort to work with small school district teachers and administrators, especially in the areas of school emotional or social emotional learning and distance learning, professional development. The CC team has done an incredible job and the board should be proud of their work as we are in the field. Fantastic. It's always nice to hear from the field about the hard work and validations of the team. Um, are there any others, Leanne? No, no additional That's public comment. Great, then we will close uh, item eight for our general com uh, public comment. That concludes the, the uh, CCE governing board meeting. Are there any final comments from the board? There are none. Any final comments, Tom? Uh, no final comments in particular, but I, I do want the, everybody to know that the governor is making his announcement right now on Twitter. So when we jump off, we may want to jump on there too about plans to how they plan to close down part of the state. So. Um, I think we'll all be busy the rest of the afternoon for sure. I for sure. Thank our staff in particular. Thank you, Matt, for your leadership and Leanne sure. uh, in particular for all of her good work. Thank you. And uh, our next uh, board meeting will be scheduled for Thursday, February 4th, 2021. That being said, I'll say Happy New Year now. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Happy New Year. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Happy holidays.